Campaign Life Coalition Youth and Niagara Region Right to Life present the National March for Life Youth Conference with guest speakers Tony McFadden, Joseph Backholm, Jay Watts, and Will Witt. What's up guys? My name is Will Witt and I'm super excited to be speaking to the National March for Life Youth Conference. How do you heal from a heartbreak? What does it look like to wait with purpose in your singleness? And how do you prepare for marriage if you are single? I've gone across the country to tons and tons of campuses and on the street and talked to literally hundreds of people about abortion and other political and cultural issues. And so my talk is going to be giving you guys the skills so that you can use the right questions, facts, and everything else so that you can change people's minds on the issue. Are you prepared to impact the lives of the people around you for the cause of life? I'm going to talk about why political issues are not actually about politics. All of this is going to help you become a much more effective communicator when we talk about the things that matter most. The National March for Life Youth Conference. Now here are your hosts, Josie Lutke and Matea Murta. Welcome to I Am With You, the 2021 National March for Life Youth Conference brought to you by Campaign Life Coalition Youth and Niagara Region Right to Life. My name is Josie Lutke and I will be one of your co-hosts this afternoon. And my name is Matea Murda and I'm your other co-host. And we are so excited for you to be joining us today for this special event. You are going to leave this event leaving empowered and equipped to stand for life in the defense for the pre-born. But first, let's fully introduce ourselves. I'm from Oakville, Ontario. I serve as the CLC Youth Coordinator, and that's a role that I've had for around two years now. So I've been involved with Campaign Life Coalition since 2015. I serve on the National March Life Organizing Committee and the Life Chain Canada Committee. So you can say that I'm passionate about activism. I also write a monthly column for the interim newspaper, Canada's Life and Family newspaper. I do want to take a moment to plug that. If you are a student doing a project on abortion or euthanasia or some other life issue, you can access their archives for free and they go all the way back to 1983. So definitely uh, worthwhile to um, look them up if you have the chance. And so uh, I also have like a really great passion for ethics and educating people about the pro-life position. So it really is a blessing for me to be able to do the work that I do. And a little bit on my background, I previously worked on Parliament Hill with a very pro-life member of Parliament, Brad Trost. And then I worked with a cabinet minister before in the province of Saskatchewan before coming to work alongside Campaign Life Coalition as their global policy and advocacy advisor and UN representative. So I do a lot of writing, a lot of research and a lot of networking. That's a huge part of my job. And I do write on, on various subjects so that's happening at the UN with regards to life from womb to tomb and all things national sovereignty at the post-millennial, Rebel News, True North, and of course with CLC. So uh, I am so excited uh, for this event to be participating in this event. I've attended the youth conference in previous years and the lineup that we have for this year is incredible. So you're going to be equipped. And with that, Josie, I'll hand it back to you. Uh, so we, we need to address the elephant in the room, which is that we're not all in the same room. Uh, I know it's a, a bummer that the youth conference has gone virtual this year, uh, but there are also advantages to it. You don't have to worry about transportation or accommodation costs. And I know that we have people tuning in from across Canada right now uh, who otherwise might not have been able to go to Ottawa. Still, I hope at least some of you were able to be on Parliament Hill yesterday in our nation's capital. Um, like Matea, I myself uh, attended a uh, youth conference many times before throughout high school. I looked forward to it every year. I know I'm not the only one to feel that way. So I do want to reassure you that even though this is online, this youth conference is going to be every bit as educational and inspirational as it always is. Um, as Matea said, we've put together a really high caliber speaker roster that we otherwise might not have been able to. So you're definitely in for a really great program today. Um, Matea, can you tell our attendees a little bit more about what they might expect schedule-wise? 
So we have four amazing speakers lined up for you, each of which will briefly be introduced before the 40 minute talk by both Josie or myself. And then we'll jump into a brief Q&A session afterwards to discuss various questions coming in from youth conference attendees, as well as questions from Josie and myself. First off, our first speaker will be Tony McFadden from Relationships Matter. She's a dear friend, and she'll be discussing her own abortion story, as well as talking about the importance of having God-honoring relationships. Then we'll jump into Jay Watts' talk, and Jay is from Merely Human Ministries, and he'll be discussing with us pro-life apologetics, or how to communicate the pro-life message effectively. After that, we will have Joseph Backholm from the Family Research Council in Washington, D.C. to discuss different worldviews. And that's really key for us to understand in this fight for life. Now, after that segment of the conference is over, we will be jumping into a brief time to, if you're out east, to go and grab your dinner. And if you're like me, who's out west, I will be having a brief snack. And there will be a lot of musical performances that have been submitted going on in the background. So feel free to just sit back, have your meal, have some great music, great food, and then we'll jump back into the program around 6.20 Eastern time so that we can hear from Will Witt from PragerU. I'm so excited. I got to do Will's interview and you are going to be really, really equipped and empowered after his talk is over. Now, finally, if you registered in advance for the youth conference, you should have received an email link that will offer the opportunity for you to join a session after the conference is almost over at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And you make sure you write down any notes or questions that you want to have answered during that session, and we will get to those for you. And during those that session time, we will equip you with the knowledge that you've received uh, during this conference so that you can actually apply it in your everyday lives, so that you leave empowered and emboldened and knowing that you are not alone and that we here at the March for Life and all those joining, we are truly standing with you. Now, with that, Josie, would you be able to elaborate a little bit more on the National March for Life uh, Youth Committee and why they chose this specific theme of I am with you? Sure. Um, and that's because the National March Life organizing team chose the theme, You Are Not Alone. And so we thought the idea of I am with you would really complement that. We chose You Are Not Alone because we know that that's how women in crisis pregnancies feel. We know that's how our seniors feel right now or anyone struggling with, with mental illness, um, that especially now that euthanasia is being offered to them. And we know that that same sentiment of abandonment um, is being communicated when our politicians refuse to legislate protection for the preborn. I also know that's probably how each of you feel, being the only pro-lifer in your classroom or your workplace or your friend group. Perhaps you even feel like here you are doing the Lord's work, uh, defending the least of his children, and he is nowhere to be found. And perhaps you even feel all the more that way in the midst of a, of a pandemic. And so the National March for Life Organizing Committee wanted to convey the opposite message, a reminder that is hopeful and affirming and positive, you are not alone. But the only way for that to be true is for someone to say, I am with you. So this youth conference is about empowering you to be that person who says, I am with you, to be the person who brings light in the midst of darkness, truth, those who are deceived, and most importantly, love, for we know that God is love. So Matea, did you have any thoughts that you want to, wanted to add to the theme of I am with you? Absolutely. To be truthful, I've worked on, on Parliament Hill and in various other political roles and, and being a pro-lifer can be really, really difficult. And I have felt quite alone and alienated at many segments in time. And so I am, I am so blessed to know that there are people who are speaking out because when I saw people, when I felt so lonely, I saw them speaking out and being bold and courageous and defense for life. 
I, I went directly to them to form community. And that has been the, the storyline of my life, where in my speaking out, I've gained a whole new community of people to not only support me and love me, but also I do the same for them. And so I'm, I'm really grateful that the March for Life actually saw this need to speak up and to say, you are not alone and we are here with you. So I am really excited uh, for this, this whole talk, this whole conference to continue on and for us to wrap up the entire March for Life with this conference as a response to the theme of the March for Life of You Are Not Alone with us saying here today that we are standing here with you. So if we were in person at the Ottawa Conference and Events Center, by now we would have gone over a bunch of housekeeping items like where the washrooms are. But if you don't know where the washrooms are in your own home, I can't help you. So uh, that out of the way, um, let's just sit back, uh, get comfy and jump right into the youth conference. All right, well, welcome everyone. Today we have Tony with us and she is an incredible speaker. Tony is an international pro-life speaker and she's the founder of the program Relationships Matter, something you definitely need to look into. Tony shares her abortion story of regret with transparency, which is really hard to do, yet vulnerability is so impactful. But her listeners are left with hope. And this is the key. Tony is the Minority Outreach and Healthy Relationships Director for Students for Life of America. Tony has spoken alongside pro-life advocates such as Stephanie Gray and Star Parker on a debate panel in Mexico. She has also presented alongside Alveda King, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s niece, at the first national pro-life summit after the 47th annual March for Life. Tony holds a bachelor degree from Westchester University and her master's degree in biblical counseling from Summit University. She was the former relationship educator and director of relationship education program in the greater Philadelphia area for six years and has shared this program internationally in Africa and in Israel. Tony is married to her wonderful husband, Chris. I can attest to this. I've met Chris. He's wonderful for 11 years, and they have four incredibly beautiful children. She loves helping people see their worth and giving them hope through her own story, as well as being an advocate for the unborn, being a stay-at-home mom, and spending time with her family. So welcome, Tony. Thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. So Tony and I have known each other for quite some time now. We've become good friends and I can attest to her being the epitome of what the theme of the National March for Life Youth Conference is, and that is I am with you. She has been there to love on me, to counsel me, to walk through difficulties with me. And so I'm so encouraged that each and every one of you gets to hear her testimony and also learn from her life experience. So with that, Let's jump into Tony's talk. Hi, everyone. My name is Tony McFadden, and I am so excited to be a part of the I Am With You National March for Life Youth Conference. And I'm here to share with you today an important message that I believe you will probably need to hear over and over and over again. And I promise that all of this will tie into the pro-life message. I believe that in order to, for unplanned pregnancies to decrease, we have to have an honest conversation about sex and relationships. You're being bombarded with a message when it comes to, to sex and relationships that is degrading, I believe it's dishonest, and it's detrimental to you. And the purpose of my presentation, Relationships Matter, is not only focused on saving sex for marriage, although we will talk about that. I really want to equip you to combat the culture's lies on sex and relationships. But I also want to explain why God has set such a high standard of wanting us to wait until marriage before engaging in sexual activity. And so I hope the tools that I share with you today will also not just help yourself, but help others um, that you come across who are, you know, hearing different things about sex and relationships and so that you're equipped to challenge them as well. So if you don't understand why saving sex for marriage is worth it, most likely you're probably not going to wait. 
you have to understand why. And if you're listening and you, maybe you've had sex before, I am not here to make you feel condemned. That is not the purpose of my presentation. I'm here to say that your past does not have to determine your future. However, today is a new day and it is a day to set a new foundation, not only for yourself, but also for your future spouse and your future children. So I want to start with this. I am not here to say that sex is bad or evil or dirty and so are people if they're doing it. So everyone take a deep breath. That's not my message. I believe that sex is a really good thing. If it didn't feel good, would there be people so obsessed with doing it? No, that'd be weird. It's supposed to feel good. So I wouldn't say that sex is bad, but I would say sex in and of itself is incredibly powerful. Think about it. Is there anything more powerful you could do on a Friday night or really any night of the week than create another human being? I mean, you can have sex one time with one person. It could be the first time you've ever had sex and you could have another person. That's powerful. And not only could you create a life, but you could also cause death. What do I mean by that? You can get HIV AIDS, um, an STI that could lead to death. So my question is, where do you hear about sex? TV, movies, music, your friends. So how do you know what's true? Because commercials and the TV shows and you know, the commercials that they show you, they know that sex sells, right? And they promote it in a way that's going to get you to either watch their show or buy their product. They could really care less about you. So they know that sex feels good. And so what they're basically telling you is to act solely based on a feeling. Now, how many of you get sick and tired of hearing your parents tell you you need to do what before you act. And I hope you thought, think, right? They tell you to think before you act. And I'm here to tell you why. Because before you leave their house for good, they want you to be a mature person. And they know that someone who thinks before they act, make decisions based off of what is true, not only develops self-control, but they're developing maturity. Because I know some of you know some 18 year olds who are not mature. So maturity is not based on an age, it's based on being able to think before you act. Now, how many of you have gone into a supermarket and seen like a three year old flipping out because his mom wouldn't give him, you know, whatever candy or whatever. Now, I'm not expecting a three year old to be mature. It's not like he thought, hey, mom said no, so I'll let me think about this. I'm gonna flip out, scream, and bite people, you know, and thought through the process. He's three. So mom has a job to do, and her job at this age is to teach him to think before he acts, develop that self control in him so when he's older, he knows how to do that. Because if he doesn't develop self control, that is going to play into other decisions he makes down the road. And as I said, this has to be taught at a very young age because you're going to need self-control for the rest of your life. Now, let's talk about marriage. How many of you someday would like to get married? And I'm assuming most of you do. Now, maybe there's a few of you who are like, no way, I do not want to get married. And I'm not surprised by that either because there is a really high divorce rate. But I also understand Regardless, there are people, a large majority, that still want to get married. And we want someone who's going to love us for how long? Forever. That's not a bad desire to have. We all have one thing in common. From the moment we're born to the moment we die, the deepest desire of all of our hearts, it's not fame, it's not fortune, and it's not pleasure. It's to be loved. Oh, isn't that cute? But think about it. When a newborn baby comes screaming into this world, what's the only thing that's going to make that child stop crying? It's mother. You put that child on its mother's chest, it's like a little miracle, it stops crying. You cannot give that baby, you know, like a $20 bill, some designer jeans and expect it to be quiet, right? Uh, it needs love. And you know what? We're still screaming out for love. It just looks differently. But the world tells us that somehow sex equals love. 
But if sex really did equal love, would you see so many people walking around feeling hurt, feeling used over a sexual relationship that didn't turn out the way that they thought it would? And what I'm saying to you today is you're worth more than that. So if marriage is the goal for you someday, guess what? You need to prepare for that right now. Because putting a ring on your finger is not automatically going to make you faithful, honest, and trustworthy. You either have put those things into who you are or you haven't because there's no power in a ring. What the culture says is because you're young that you could have sex with whoever you want to, whenever you want to, and it's no big deal. But guess what? When you're standing at that altar someday in front of all your friends and family, and you're standing in the front of the most important person of your life, it is going to matter. So how do you prepare for that altar? Each and every one of you are building what I would call a foundation for your life. And you're either building on what is true, or you're building on whatever you feel like. Jesus said this in Matthew uh, chapter 7, verses 24 through 26. He said, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain fell and the streams rose and the winds blew against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the streams rose and the winds blew against that house and great was the crash. So this is a picture that I have when I think about a foundation. The world is building relationships and marriages without the foundation of Christ. And we can see the results, right? And I'm not saying Christians don't ever get divorced, but what I am saying is if you don't want divorce, if you want a marriage that's going to last till death do you part, then you have to prepare your foundation now. You're never going to go to a wedding and hear them say, I now pronounce you husband and wife to divorce do you part because you cheated on each other. That's not in the vow. It's not supposed to be. Again, the culture says sex feels good, act on it. I would say that's like building your foundation on sand. How many of you would build a beach house on the sand? No one. Why? Because you know when the storm comes, that house is going to be destroyed. You build it on a strong foundation to prepare for the storm long before it ever hits. So how does this relate to our relationships? To a relationship. Guys, what you're told is that in order to be a real man, you need to give it as many girls as you can, as fast as you can, by age 18, there's something wrong with you. You can't get any. And the worst possible word you could be called is a virgin. Now we're living in a society that is trying to take away your manhood when we, re we need real, strong, hardworking, and protected men. Ladies, if the man of your dreams comes to you and he's like, honey, I love you so much, but let me be honest with you. I've only slept with, you know, this many girls, but they meant nothing to me. Are you going to be like, wow, you're such a real man. Put that ring on me right now. Guys, same thing. If the girl of your dreams says the same thing, I've only slept with this many guys, but they meant nothing to me. You're my whole world. Are you going to be like, wow, that's so beautiful? No. Why? Because if you're going to spend the rest of your life with someone, the one question you're going to want to know is not how good you are in bed. The one question you're going to want to know is, can I trust you? And I normally do not have to tell people that. That comes out of that deep desire of our hearts. So why wait for marriage? The reason God says we wait until marriage is not because it's really easy to do. If it was easy, everyone would be waiting. But on your wedding day, you get married in front of all your friends and family. So this man takes his entire foundation. This woman takes her entire foundation and becomes like one. It's no longer I and I. It's now we. It's now us. Everything you've done in your past, now everything you're going to do in the future is automatically going to affect that person. That night, everyone goes home. And for the very first time, this man takes his body, this woman takes her body, and they become like one body. In this moment, sex is more than just about a feeling. What they're doing with their bodies is actually an example of what they just did with their lives at the altar a couple of hours ago. 
They brought their lives together be, to be one. Now sex is an expression of that. The only thing they're wearing in that moment is their wedding rings, which is a symbol that sex in this moment is protected by a lifelong commitment. It's powerful. What people are doing outside of the boundary of marriage is they're marrying their bodies, but without their lives. So either person has the freedom to do what at any time? Leave. And countless people have their hearts handed back to them in a million pieces. And you watch that person move on with another person and do the same things they just did with you. And you're just supposed to get over that. That's devastating. That is, should not be normal. You're worth more than that. So let's talk about realistic situation. And let's say I pull a 16 year old girl aside and she's been dating her boyfriend for six months and I ask her why she's having sex with him. What is she gonna say? She, she loves him and I hope she's feeling loved. He, maybe she feels special, she feels wanted, he tells her she's beautiful. All these things that she's longed for someone to say, he has said to her. That's why I'm never going to say sex is bad. It should make you feel that way. Now, if I pull the guy aside, he's probably not going to say I'm having sex with her because she makes me feel so beautiful and special, right? Um, contrary to what the culture says, though, there is a difference between guys and girls. And you know what? He wants to feel loved, too. It's just expressed in a different way. Him feeling loved is him feeling respected. OK, so now let's just say a couple of months down the road, I find out this couple has broken up because the girlfriend cheated on him with his best friend. Guys aren't supposed to have feelings, but how is he feeling now? He's feeling hurt. He's feeling angry, rejected, jealous, disrespected. I can name a whole bunch of things that he's probably feeling. Sex was never supposed to make people feel like that. That is what I call emotional baggage. The baggage is what we carry around with us because no one's telling you how to deal with it. And they tell you to just get into another relationship, hoping that the pain will just go away and you won't have to deal with it. But you know what happens? You drag all of that hurt from that relationship into the next relationship. So that's why I think boundaries are a good idea. Now, when you think of the word boundary, do you think of something negative or positive? Most people think negative, but I want to do a spin on it and show you why boundaries are actually a really good thing and how it's beneficial in a relationship. Now, go with me with this. Let's just pretend we're on a big steep hill. We're in a tractor trailer truck at the top of this big hill and at the bottom of the hill, there's rocks. We don't want to come crashing into them. Where are you going to put your brakes on? I hope you said at the top of the hill. Why? Because you know the further you go, the more difficult it's going to be to stop. Now, is that because gravity is bad? No, it's because we know that gravity is powerful. Now, you got that picture in your head. Now, let's switch this up and say this hill represents a couple. There's a guy and a girl at the top of the hill. You picture in that? And at the bottom of the hill, still the rocks, but the rocks represent emotional baggage. Um, STIs, um, an unplanned pregnancy, all the things you don't want to deal with. So to avoid this, what do you have to do in a relationship? You set a boundary. Now, a couple that's together, you could probably tell they're together because they hug, maybe, you know, they're holding hands and they're kissing. So let's say there's other things they can do down this hill. But if you notice, I didn't say sex equals the rocks because I don't say, think that sex is bad. But what I would say is set a boundary for your relationship. If you don't want to deal with emotional baggage and all those things, then you have to set a boundary to protect not only yourself, but also the other person. A boundary protects you because if every time you get together, if sex is not an option, what are you doing? talking. Imagine that. You're actually having a conversation and getting to know each other. Obviously, it's easier to be physical than it is to communicate because sex makes you feel like you know each other. But do you really know each other? I often challenge couples that are physical in their relationships to take anything physical out of the relationship for a period of time. And that will show you the foundation of what your relationship is really based on. So just as gravity pulls a truck down the hill, what pulls a couple down the hill 
is um, sexually is called arousal. Now, arousal is normal. It's natural and it's normal. It's your body preparing for sex. But just like gravity, it's powerful. And the further you go, the, f the more things you do, the more difficult it is to stop. So do not decide where your boundary is going to be when you get into a relationship. That's something you need to think about now, whether you're in a relationship or not. So guys and girls are actually aroused differently. A guy can see a girl and be ready to fly down that hill. And it's not because guys are jerks. It's because God has designed them to be visually stimulated. And in a marriage, that's a really good thing. So the battle for guys outside of marriage is you can't control what a girl wears, or should I say doesn't wear. That is, you know, the battle for you. But for a girl, she could look at this guy and think he's cute, but that's not necessarily what's going to make her want to fly down the hill. It's what he says to her. He tells her she's beautiful. All the things she's longed for someone to say, maybe it's the first guy to ever say those things to her. That's powerful. Your words are powerful, guys. So if sex is not an option, it will no longer cloud your decision because say you guys end up breaking up. If you break up, will it be sad? Yes. Will you cry? Maybe. Um, but here's the powerful thing. You haven't taken something from each other that hadn't belonged to you in the first place. And you can walk away from that relationship, I would think, um, knowing each other a little bit more, knowing yourself a little bit more, without being confused because you've done something so intimate that you can never take back. Now, for myself personally, the reason I do this presentation is because I want to be for you what I needed when I was your age. I did not, I was born into kind of a sandy foundation and my dad has been married three times and I just never had a good picture of what marriage is supposed to look like. And I didn't grow up in a strong Christian home. I knew about Christianity and, and things like that, but um, it wasn't like the main thing of um, my family. So long story short, I'll try to speed up through some things um, time-wise, um, but my senior year in high school, that is when I faced an unplanned pregnancy. And I remember sitting in the waiting room of this abortion clinic and sitting right across from me was my boyfriend and I had been dating him off and on for about two years. And right next to me was my best friend. And these are supposed to be the two, two of the closest people in my life, yet I felt alone, I felt scared, I was confused. And knowing what I know now, I realized I was so uneducated. And I realized for the first time, I'm thinking, how did I get to this place? Like, how did I get here? And this goes back to what I talked about earlier is this foundation. I had been making so many decisions based on a feeling, based on how I felt in the moment, rather than being grounded in truth. Um, because truth remains true no matter how you feel. And um, sex will always be powerful. It doesn't matter how you feel in the moment when you decide to do it. It always has the power to create life. It always has the power to cause death. And I'm in this situation now where I want to take back this decision and I can't. And so I was about seven weeks long and the nurse at this abortion clinic said something to me that I will never forget. When I went to get, into, get my ultrasound, the monitor was faced away from me. And now I know that was on purpose. And when I asked if I can see the monitor, she was hesitant. But when she turned it around before I could say a word, she said, see, it's nothing. It's just the size of a pea. Now you and I both know that that's a lie. That at seven weeks, my child's heart had already begun to beat. That at conception, my child had its own DNA that's separate from mine, unique to them, that would never be created again. And But to her perspective, because of my child's size and because of their location, she did not value this child um, and viewed them as nothing. Now, I am not someone who is 
going to play a victim in this. I chose to do what I did be ultimately because I was selfish, ultimately because I didn't want my parents to find out. And I wanted to hold on to this unstable relationship that I had. So I was given the RU486 pills and I'm sure you probably have heard of these and what they do, but if you haven't, um, in a condensed version, it starves the baby to death. And then 24 to 48 hours later, a girl will take pills on her own in, in her home. And this will, the second set of pills will expel the, the baby. And for me, it was very traumatic because my pills never worked. Two months later, while I was in school, I ended up severely hemorrhaging. And we know, um, according to the FDA, there have been 24 women who have passed away from taking these very same pills. I never told my mom about this. I didn't tell my parents. My mom came and picked me up from school. I was in so much pain. I had to have someone help me walk to the nurse's office. And if any of you have seen Abby Johnson's movie Unplanned, there is a scene that sh shows very vividly what happens when you take these pills. And that's very close to what happened to me as well. Um, just for your knowledge, I'm sure most of you uh, probably know about this too, but if a girl ends up taking the first set of pills, not the second, but the first, there is something called the abortionpillreversal.com where a girl can actually go to an OBGYN who is pro-life and is able to reverse that. But it has to be within 48 hours um, of taking the first set of pills. So I went through this basically by myself. And um, let me not forget to tell you that my boyfriend it actually ended up breaking up with me the day after he went to the abortion clinic with me. So not only did I go through this by myself, but I was also dealing with this breakup as well. And so it was devastating and my life kind of spiraled out of control. And, you know, I still wasn't making good decisions. And this caused me, I think, to be even more promiscuous because, um, you know, I just thought, well, I've already done it and the shame was already there. And like I said before, I had all this emotional baggage now and I didn't know how to deal with it. And no one was teaching me how to deal with it. And um, and I think when you don't have faith and you don't have Jesus as your foundation, you're grabbing on to anything to give you worth. And that goes back to the Matthew 7 passage that I read that I was building my life on sand. It was shifting and changing and there was no truth under me. My favorite two words are, but God. So about three years later, that's when I became a Christian. I became a Christian while I was in college and I gone. I had gone to an adult Bible study, a young adult Bible study called um, Campus Crusade for Christ. And that's big in America. It's in a lot of universities there. And that's where I became um, a Christian and that changed my whole worldview. And one thing I do want to point out, though, is it took me three years to share with people that I had had an abortion. And I think that I was scared of that because I had run into people who were standing outside of Planned Parenthood and were handing out things and I was post abortive and I never talked to anyone. And so I was just unsure about how they would perceive me if I told anyone. But God is too good to keep us where we're at. And he brought people in my life who dismantled those lies. And lo and behold, I actually start working for a pregnancy resource center. And I would go into schools and I would give presentations similar to what I'm giving you today. And I would speak on saving sex for marriage and I would share my story of how at the t for many years of my life, I didn't wait. But now I was in a place where I was waiting for my husband and I didn't know at this time who I was going to marry. And I didn't know when they would come into my life. 
And, but I thought, you know, I, you can love someone you've never met. Most of you don't know when you're going to get married, right? But it's like, how do you prepare to love someone you, if you don't even know who they are? But I, I would explain it in this way. I'm dealing with a lot of my baggage now, so I don't drag that into my marriage. I'm setting a new standard for myself. I'm not giving myself away anymore to guys um, like I did before. And that is loving my future spouse. Um, and it's protecting myself regardless if I had gotten married or not. So I was single for a long time, for <laughs> about a little over close to nine years or so I was single. I had one boyfriend before my husband came along and it was only for like eight months and which taught me a lot. And um, the first relationship where our sex was not a part of the relationship. And as I mentioned before, when we broke up, it was the same thing. Like I was sad and it was, um, you know, and I cried, but I realized I didn't take anything from him. He didn't take anything from me that didn't belong to each other. And so I was able to leave that relationship in a healthier way than all my other relationships. So little do I know for about two years, someone had been looking for me. And this person had been looking for me because similar to me, God had grabbed a hold of their hearts. And there were some people that this person knew they needed to go back and apologize to. So do you remember the guy I told you about who I um, had the abortion with? Okay, the ex-boyfriend who broke up with me the day after. Okay, so we had not seen each other in almost close to nine and a half something years. And he finally finds me on all places, Facebook, and <laughs> he writes me and says, you know, I really would like to get together with you. There's some things that I want to share with you and I don't want it to be over social media and I'd rather do it in person. And so, of course, I'm kind of in shock and my guard was up and I was kind of like, what is happening? Why? Like <laughs> out of nowhere. And I had forgiven him. I had gone through um, a Bible study, a 12 week Bible study to go through my healing for my abortion called Forgiven and Set Free by Linda Cochran. And so I went through the forgiveness. But, you know, it's a little different when you have someone, you know, sitting right in front of you. So I did meet, end up meeting with him. And I'll never forget the one thing he said to me. He said, it was easier for me to relieve that relationship because I didn't want to face the fact that we ended the life of our child. And in that moment, I realized that abortion did not just affect women, that it also did affect men. Why? Because God has called men to protect and not only did he not protect me, but he did not protect our child. So long story short, in a miracle of all miracles, I actually became his wife less than a year later. And we've been married now for almost 12 years. God has blessed us with um, five children. I say five, four on earth, one who is in heaven, and something very special we were able to do was we were able to honor our unborn baby at our wedding. We just wrote in the bottom of our program that we were going to light an extra candle to um, acknowledge our unborn child. So I know it's kind of crazy that the <laughs> that kind of story doesn't happen often. And we're so blessed. And I really believe that every time I share my story, Every time my husband shares um, our story that our child is no longer a statistic, that we are giving voice um, to them and um, helping others to not choose this path and also helping women and men who have, who have walked the path of abortion to find healing because the healing only came through um, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's the only reason I can present this um, confidently and without shame because Jesus' blood did what it was supposed to do and it has set me free. And so um, 
All that to say is that I've been on both sides of these spectrums. I've been on the side where I did not wait for marriage and I've been building my life on a feeling and uh, following the culture. But then there's something powerful when you begin to think for yourself and you begin to think beyond what the media is saying and what the culture is saying and what your friends are saying and you step back and you begin to think for yourself. And when I began to have high standards, I started meeting people who had high standards as well. And it's been a beautiful thing to watch and see um, the healing that has taken place. So again, those of you who are like me and have walked a path where you've had sex before, do not walk out of this conference feeling guilty. Like I said in the beginning, today is a new day. Your past does not have to determine your future. You can begin to rebuild your foundation now. And those of you who haven't had sex, keep going. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I have, I have so many friends who have gotten married that waited until they were married to have sex. I've never heard any of them say, oh, I wish I would have had sex with so many other people. You know, I've only heard people like myself who have said, you know what? I wish I would have had, I wish I would have waited. And so God is the creator of relationships and how we treat one another matters. And I want to raise the standard rather than lower it for you. We are living in a time where relationships are not honored and therefore marriage is not honored. And I want to go back to God honoring relationships. It will not be easy, but I promise you, it will be worth it. And so I wanna thank you so much for having me. It is an honor to encourage all of you to continue to stand and be a voice for life. And again, I believe it has to start in the preventative side too. We can't just talk about um, just protecting life in the womb. Obviously that's very important, but we also have to speak about the preventative side and so that people understand the purpose of sex and relationships because God is the creator of them. So enjoy the rest of this amazing conference. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime. I'm on Instagram as Tony McFadden 12 if you have any questions. So thanks again. It's been great to share with you. Bye. Wow. Well, thank you, Tony. That I, I love how you use your story to not only equip people, but to empower them. And relationships, so many people go to the internet nowadays to find the, the answers to relationship questions. So what are some of the resources that you can give to people today? I know they can go to, to your website and to connect with you online, but you've garnered a lot of wisdom. And how, what are some of those people or places that you have gained that from? Well, first I would say, if you have parents that are together and have a solid foundation, your parents should be your first resource because your friends know just as much as you do. Um, unfortunately, if you don't have that, someone that's older than you, older than you can speak truth into your life. I would say that's definitely a great, great resource um, because they're watching your lives. They're involved in your life um, more than someone like me. I wish I could be involved in everyone's <laughs> life, but I can't. Um, but the other thing, um, one of my resources I love to go to is Focus on the Family. They are a great resource as well. Um, they have uh, tons of articles and encouragement um, that's combating against the culture. So um, that's just a practical resource. But I always tell my kids, you surround yourself, tell us a lot who you are. So surround yourself with people who are living high standards as well. Yes, that is so true. So, so true. Thank you, Tony. And, and something that I love about your talk is you touch, you really poke at the, and like pull on the heartstrings of people, like the things that run, the thoughts that run through people's minds, you're giving answers to and equipping them with. So what are, what are some of the feedback that people have given to you when you've done this presentation or talk to people one-on-one -on -one about why relationships really do matter? Well, especially when I've gone into middle schools and high school, uh, a lot of adults say, 
well, you know, they may not take what you're saying. So don't be offended. And these kids are longing for someone to tell them that their value and their worth matters, that the heartbreak they've experienced is real and should be talked about and not just pushed aside and just thought of like, oh, well, you're young. It's no big deal. I'm what I've found is that a lot of kids are saying, I wish someone would have told me this earlier, yeah. or I'm so glad I heard or they're saying, thank you for those who are, are waiting for marriage and they haven't, you know, experienced anything. It encourages them like, okay, this is difficult now, but I'm understanding why it's worth it. And so, and I say in the presentation, if you remember, I said, if you don't understand why you're waiting, you're not going to wait. You have to understand the purpose behind it. So I've gotten tons of feedback and obviously people love that I've experienced the heartbreak, but I've also um, have experienced the victory. Mm-hmm. So I've been on side, so I'm able to with both sides of compassion and truth and conviction, um, which I think is helpful for anyone wherever they are on the spectrum. That's awesome. So what's, what is next for Tony McFadden? What is on the agenda next? What can people know anyway? Cause I know everybody has a secret to hold, but what's right. new, what's next? Well, I may be writing my book. <gasps> Finally. Yes. I know. I know. Yes. So, that is wonderful. Fingers crossed the end of the year. But yes. Awesome. I have, so now I don't call of Canada. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> well, we look forward to reading that book and to getting to see more of you. How can people stay connected with you either online or through communications? Yeah, I'm on Facebook, which I know you young people don't use, but I'm also <laughs> I'm on Instagram. Tony Very young, Tony. It's all good. <laughs> Tony McFadden 12 on Instagram and um, my website is TonyMcFadden.com. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Tony, for your time and for your sharing your life story and equipping us, empowering us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Take care. Hi, guys. So next, we'll be hearing from Jay Watts, who will be teaching us about pro-life apologetics. He's the founder and president of Merrily Human Ministries. Jay, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a, it's a privilege to be here. So a little bit about your background first. Uh, you began in the pro-life movement as the development coordinator for Cobb Pregnancy Services in Georgia. Yes. I believe you are still on their board as well. Yes. And you spent eight years at the Life Training Institute under Scott Klissendorf as their Vice President of Development and Communications before founding Merely Human Ministries. And you've been to schools, um, you've spoken to organizations on the radio, television. And I believe prior to all of that, you were a pro-choice atheist. So can you tell us about your conversion? Yeah, that was, um, when I was younger, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't grow up in a Christian environment. I mean, I grew up in the South in the United States. So that's, that's what a guy by the name of uh, Ben Witherington III, I think calls it, uh, Ben Witherington III calls it a Jesus haunted culture. So you know about Jesus, but not really. He's, he's kind of everywhere while at the same time, not explicitly understood by most people. And so that's the culture I grew up, but I was an atheist. Uh, and as an atheist, I went, I bent toward all the, uh, there's no objective morality, no right and wrong. Everything is either social contract or agreed upon things. Basically, I thought it was just kind of garbage that, that we all just made up what we needed to make up to get by. And all throughout college, I believed that and was outspokenly and hostily pro-choice. At the time when I was younger too, and going through that, there was a different environment. Um, Operation Rescue was really the face of the pro-life movement, and that was hard to understand from the other side. 
Uh, I know people now who are part of that movement. And I talk to them and I learn about it from their position. But as a pro-choice atheist on the other side, it was difficult to understand what was going on. It looked crazy or like madness to me. And so I didn't like the whole conversation about abortion at all, except for to get argue and hostile about it when people would bring it up. I, I said some of the things that I actually argue against, which I think are some of the dumber arguments out there. One of them obviously being, I'm a man, so I shouldn't say anything about this ever because I'm never going to have a child. And I remember arguing that with conviction, like it made sense back then. And so as I look back on it now, I try to talk. That's part of what motivates me to do what I do. I really want to talk as much as I can in a way that would reach that guy that I was. Because uh, I, I remember the people that tried to reach me and the reasons that it failed to make a dent in me. And I know the one person who did ultimately reach me and what they did right. And so I'm trying my best to honor that person as much as I can for the rest of my life. What ultimately led to the transition, it was two things. Number one, uh, it, it started with my a, a trouble with atheism that led to a willingness to consider things. I had a broader problem with my atheistic worldview, most, most of it around the idea of the existence of moral values. There were some other things that came into it as well. Uh, but it, th there, was a, there were some logical issues as well that I struggled with. But a lot of it had to do with the sense that I had there were things that were wrong with the world that really was fuel for me against Christianity or belief in God. But the more I thought about the idea of wrongness itself, the more it seemed to point in the direction that I was uncomfortable with. And so becoming slightly unsettled with atheism, I, I explored a lot of different beliefs over the period of a year and a half or two years and, and ultimately landed in Christianity for multiple reasons I won't go into now. But one of the first things that happened when I became a Christian, which I think is funny nowadays, but back then it wasn't, is that all the Christians that I knew were pro-life. And I still wanted to be pro-choice, but there was some part of me that when I became a Christian realized there's going to be a fight one day about this, this thing internally in me. And so one of the first prayers I ever said to God when I became a Christian was, you know, God, I'll do whatever you want now that I know that you're there, now that I believe that you're there, now that you're a part of my life, I'll relearn everything. I'll do whatever you want. I am yours. If you're taking a request, though, I would prefer to never have to talk about abortion ever in my entire life. Uh, and that transition from pro-choice to pro-life, I, I, I'm ashamed to say, was a very, very slow transition. I had to become convinced through and through that the best arguments demonstrated the humanity of the unborn in order to, to finally speak out and say something. I mean, I really had to be broken to that idea that I was being silent in the face of something terrible. And it took a long time to wear through first my apathy and my resentment and to grow and to get to a place where I realized if I, if I believe the things that I seem to be gravitating towards in the belief that the unborn are one of us, they're full members of the human family. And I live in a time where the things that we're seeing happening are happening. I'm going to have to say something or else I'm going to be a part of, of a history that I don't like. The people who remain silent when they were in the face of things that they saw that were deeply wrong. And so the Christian part actually was much easier for me than the transition from pro-choice to pro-life. That took a long time, not just to wear at the man that I was who felt dogmatic about that side of things, but to ultimately uh, light a fire under me with enough of a background of knowledge and belief that I had to say something. And that transition was rough and it was hard. And it was, it, 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 I said, it broke me. But what came out of it now is, is this conviction that I have to talk about it. But it took me a long time to learn how to talk about it. And that's why I like to do, that's the talk that I'm going to give the conference here is how to talk about it, how to tackle this issue in conversations, how to be able to bring up things that are so convicting to us that they, they rightly animate our emotions. Because this issue is so intense, we ought to feel deeply about it, but those feelings can't get in the way of convincing other people of the truth. Because I firmly believe we do them a favor, as, as I felt like I was done a favor, when someone helped me to move from error to truth. They were doing me a favor, not just making, convincing me they were right, but they were doing Jay a favor. And so that's what I see that path was, that struggle to go from error to truth and how I understand what human beings are, what are basic obligations to them, and what are they on board? So I can personally testify that you do a really great job talking about it. I first heard you speak in 2019 at the Students for Life of America conference following the Washington, D.C. March for Life. 
Um, you did a phenomenal job talking about pro-life apologetics. So our audience today is in for a real treat. Um, so without further ado, let's listen and learn. I'm thrilled to be a part of this, however we can make it work. And my, my job is to help you to engage the abortion dialogue by equipping you to make a case for life and helping you to feel more comfortable to have conversations with people about maybe one of the most emotionally charged issues, certainly of our age, but of any age, that brings up the, the most emotions and tensions and passions in the people that are discussing it. And to be able to do this, to have this conversation with people, to master those emotions, to master our arguments, and to engage in it in a way which is very personally important to me, that, that changes people, that impacts them, that draws them closer to the truth. The truth that I'm going to be arguing for today is that all human beings ought to be treated with dignity and respect, and that the unborn are full members of the human family. A fetal human and an embryonic human is a full member of the human family. They are one of us and ought to be treated with the same basic duty and obligations and responsibilities that we have to any other human being, not the least of which just to not kill them. But before I make that case, before I get into arguing and how we work our way through that argument, I want to first make a case for making a case, which, which may seem unnecessary with the audience that I'm talking to here. You'd say, if I wouldn't be a part of this conference, if I didn't already want to make a case. But here's the thing. There is nothing in the world that you can do in the face of something like abortion, but particularly with abortion, there is nothing in the world that you can do that's easier than saying nothing. Saying nothing is the easiest thing that we can do. As a matter of fact, if you want something that's gonna make the world happy with you, say nothing about abortion. The entertainment industry would be thrilled with you if you say nothing about abortion. The people who run Social media, they'd love it if you say nothing about abortion. Most of your teachers, most of the scholars that we see at university levels, the majority of them would be overwhelmingly thrilled if you choose to say nothing about abortion. And the people in your lives, many of them, may also share that sentiment. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to hear about it. Oftentimes, our family members are the closest people to us. And even where I live, I live in the southern United States, in the state of Georgia. I live in the middle of what's called the Bible Belt. And all around me are people that would tell you they're Christians, and all around you there would be people that tell me that they were pro-life or that they think abortion is morally wrong. And even they are oftentimes very happy if we just don't talk about it. You see, it's easiest to say nothing. And if we do not live our lives intentionally, if we don't discipline ourselves, prepare ourselves, equip ourselves to do what is right, no matter what it is, we will always find ourselves falling back into the pattern of doing the thing that's easiest. So if talking about abortion is harder than doing nothing about abortion and doing nothing or saying nothing about abortion is the easiest thing that we can do, then we have to be intentional about engaging in it. We have to remember that we have an obligation or duty to talk about this. Now, why must we talk about abortion? Because objectively speaking, abortion is one of the most important moral issues of our age or any age around before or after us. You see, the moral cost for being wrong on abortion, either way, either the pro-life side or the pro-choice side being wrong, the moral cost of being wrong is high, too high to ignore no matter which side of this issue you're on. Let's say you're on my side. Let's say that you are a pro-life advocate and you believe that the unborn are fully human. You believe, like me, that the best scientific and philosophical arguments demonstrate that the unborn, that the fetal human, that the embryonic human, they're one of us. And that we owe them some basic duty, some basic responsibility. We're accountable for our actions to them. That they are full members of the human family. Well, if that's true, then we live in a time where the intentional destruction of human life is happening on, quite frankly, an incomprehensible scale. We're talking about numbers that we can't even imagine. Over 61 million in the United States alone since 1973 in Roe v. Wade. 61 million. And that's one country. A couple of years ago, there was an article that claimed there's 30 million abortions per year, or 35 or 40 million abortions per year. And it was interesting because there was a lot of outcry about it because the article was claiming that abortion was the number one cause of death in the world every year. And Snopes not exactly a conservative bastion over there, Snopes ran a fact check on it and said it's just simply not true that there's about 30 million abortions per year. They put the number somewhere around 55 million abortions per year based on the statistics they were able to get from the World Health Organization. 
if the unborn are fully human, if they are one of us, then the destruction is happening on an incomprehensible scale that far, far outweighs the world, the wars that we're seeing right now. Now, it may be happening in doctor's offices, it may be happening in private places, it may be happening secretly. We may not have to be forced to see it all the time the same way other indignities were forced on us in the past, but it's real. It's inarguably happening at those numbers. And if they matter, if they're one of us, then it is a great moral crime and we cannot be quiet in the face of it. But what if I'm wrong? What if you're wrong? What if anybody who's pro-life is wrong and the other side is right? What if there's no moral component to it whatsoever? What if, as Greg Kokel from Stand to Reason would say, abortion is no different than a tooth extraction? Then we still have to talk about it. Because however well-meaning people like me are, or worldwide institutions like the Roman Catholic Church, or any other group, uh, massive, large national groups or international groups that are fighting abortion, and they're doing it in elections all over the world. And it's coming up. It came up in Ireland and Argentina. It's coming up all the time in different laws and different places that people are fighting this issue out. All of the people like me who are fighting for the value of human life and laws that protect them, whether we mean well by it or not, are interfering with women's rights to freely choose a medical decision that has no moral component to it at all. And we are impacting elections, and we are impacting charitable gifts, and we're impacting Supreme Court nominations here in the United States. We're impacting all these different facets, and there's almost zero, almost no facet of your life that is not in some way or another touched by this issue. And all of it is being impacted, and all of it is being interfered with over nothing. It may be the most colossal waste of resources the world has ever seen. If they don't matter, if they don't have value, I am doing a great moral disservice to the world by animating the passions of people to stand up for the right of the unborn to continue to live to the point that I have heard from others that they are having arguments with people in their family and are looking for ways to be more constructive in those discussions. If I'm wrong, they should stand down and stop arguing. There's no way to come at this issue where it's not one of the most important moral issues of our age and we don't have an obligation or duty to talk about it. We simply must confront it. And this happens in human history. It's happened before. There are things that are so important. We have to hash it out. It would be easier to set it aside, easier to do nothing. And I tried when I was younger for years and years. I wanted nothing to do with this conversation until one day the full weight of what we're talking about laid down on top of me and I realized I have to say something. And so that's why it's important to become equipped to have this conversation. Saying nothing is not an option. So if we must say something, let's do the best that we can to say that something as well as we can. Once we've decided we want to talk about this issue, the next question comes, how do we talk about this issue? As a matter of fact, I hear that question a lot as I'm out in our community or I'm out speaking in other places. When I get done and I have the opportunity to have a dialogue with people or talk to people afterwards, a lot of times I have people that come up to me and say, I have a neighbor family member, a brother, a sister, a parent, someone whom I love or whom I care about or I want to have a conversation with. And every time I try to talk about this, it goes south. It gets bad. So can you tell me how to have a conversation with them? And so uh, the first thing that we say as we try to sort out this as far as a strategy, and the three points of this strategy are going to be, the first part of it is that we focus like a laser on the single most important question, the question that determines the right or wrong of this issue. And this is what I tell people actually about how to have a productive conversation. I say, start with this question. What is the unborn? Find out what they think the unborn are. What do they think the human fetus is? What do they think the human embryo is that we're allowed to kill them? I tell people just, when you talk to your neighbor next time and you want to have a conversation about this, just sit down and ask them that question. Tell them, look, I know what I think. I know what I believe. I want to hear you. I want to listen to you for a moment. Tell me how you answer this question. What is the unborn? What is the human fetus? What is the human embryo that we're allowed to kill it? What do you think it is? I believe they're full members of the human family. I know what I believe. But what do you think that it is that we are allowed to kill it? How do you answer that question? And then give them room to answer it. You see, the right or wrong on this issue is determined by how we answer this. Many years ago, I was told that uh, Greg Kokel from Stand to Reason and Scott, Klus Scott Klusendorf from LTI, my former boss, forever mentor, and dear friend, 
they were sitting around having lunch and Greg was saying, what is a way that we can figure out how to help people see the central issue on the abortion question? What is a way that we can help them to understand how important it is to answer the question, what is it? And he came up with something where he said, imagine you're at your sink and you're washing dishes. He said, I think I got it. Your back is to the room. Your focus is on the sink. I'm washing my dishes. And suddenly we'll say my youngest daughter, Nika, walks into the room. And I hear her ask this question from behind me. Daddy, can I kill this? Can I kill this? Well, what do I need to find out before I answer the question, can I kill this? What is it? What does she have? What is she holding? Uh, you might think it's kind of a creepy question if you're younger, but when you have kids and you're older, you will find out that all sorts of macabre things can happen with your little ones. So it's not out, it's not actually out of the, of the imagination that this would happen. So I'm at my sink, my daughter's asked this question, now I have to ask her back a question. What is it? What do you want to kill? If it's a bug or it's an insect, I don't know what you guys have going on. In Canada, in the south, in the United States, as it gets very warm, we have these things called palmetto bugs. They live outside, but they look like cockroaches on steroids. I mean, they are huge, man. And so if she's caught one of those, I'm saying, like, you know, as long as you've got it in, like, a paper towel, crush it. You know, like, destroy it. Uh, or, you know, I've, said, I've had people get upset with me about that, some animal lovers in the audience. And they're like, you should just usher it out of your house. I was like, you know, that thing could have lived outside all it wanted, but once it came into my house, it got what it deserved, right? So if it's a bug like that, or if it's something, go ahead and kill it. Yes, I endorse the killing of that bug. Just dispatch it to whatever netherworld they go to when their life ends here. If it's one of our dogs, one of my golden doodles, and it has eaten one of her Barbies or something like that, or something important to her, then still no, uh, you know, the dog should be removed, clean, everything should be cleaned up. We might chastise it, point our fingers at him and say, bad Max, bad Bingley, whatever. But what we won't do is kill the dog because dogs and animals are different and we understand that there's a difference between killing insects and killing dogs. Uh, if it's her brother who is big but he's, she somehow got him into a headlock and dragged him into the room, the answer is absolutely not, right? The question of what is it determines how I answer it. And it's amazing how, by the way, intuitional this information is. I was one time had a guy interrupt me while I was speaking in Boston and he said, how do you know that there's a difference? You just assume there's a difference between insects and dogs. And people, and so well, I'll make a case. I'm going to make my case as I talk about the value of human beings later. But you accept this too. Intuitionally, you grasp that, right? I mean, if you go to Home Depot or go to a store like that, a hardware store, it seems natural to you when you come up to a garden pest destroying section where, where, where they'll give you the ability to kill bugs or, or to take care of pests that live in your garden. There's all sorts of devices there for killing them. And for the most part, most of us look at that, that section and just think, eh, I get it. Even if it's not your thing, right, you get it, right? But if Home Depot right next to that had a section that was like kill your neighbor's cats and dogs section, I think then you would start to freak out a little bit. You think something's gone weird at Home Depot. And if the very next section over was to kill your neighbor's section, then you would know that there's something horribly wrong at Home Depot or whatever hardware store you have found yourself in. You see, we intuitionally understand and function this way all the time. So every time you drive your car or you go to a place, you're running over bugs and you're killing them. Things are dying for you to get from one place to another and you just don't care. And you're going to keep doing it. You're not going to allow it to paralyze you in life. But had you run over a squirrel or had you run over a dog, you would feel a little bit differently maybe, or a rabbit or something like that. Something different than the bugs that you're running over. And if you ran over a human being, it would be totally different. In my home state of Georgia, if a human being dies in a traffic accident, they shut down the interstate. Animals, the bigger animals, they'll just drive off, they'll drag off the road, they'll have somebody come up and collect it. But a human being dies, we shut it down. And it doesn't matter how much traffic it takes because that was more important to figure out what went wrong and to make sure that there's nobody else in danger or whatever else happened. We intuitionally operate like this. Now, if I say that the unborn are fully human, I'm making my case, and I ask them, what is the unborn? I have to watch out for a few mistakes that they make. Once we embrace the idea that answering that question gives us the answer to whether or not we're allowed to kill it, what is it? Please tell me what you think it is that we're allowed to kill it. We have to work out, look out for a couple of basic mistakes that people make when they start to answer this question. The first one is that they assume without argument that the unborn are the kind of thing we're allowed to kill. They'll assume that it's not like us, not one of us, not our neighbor. And we have to be careful. Now, one of the questions we always tell people to ask themselves when somebody gives an answer to see, to test if they're assuming the unborn are not human, if they're not the same as we and I, is to ask would they give the same justification if we were talking about killing a two-year-old, if we were talking about killing a 10-year-old, if we were talking about killing a newborn, 
would they justify killing any one of those with the same argument that they just gave me? And if the answer is no, then they believe that there's a clear distinction between that newborn two-year-old, 10-year-old, and the fetus. But they don't get to assume that. They have to prove it. Now, we do use a tool that I was taught by Greg Kokel and Scott Klusendorf called Trot Out the Toddler, where when we say, when we ask that question, would they offer this? Well, one way to test them and to see that if they're willing to embrace the consequences of their view is what we call Trot Out the Toddler. And I'll give you a more difficult aspect of that. One time I was speaking at a school out in California, and this gentleman stands up and he says, Mr. Watts, privacy is the thing. We have a right, women have a right to privacy. They have the right to make private medical decisions without the interference of the state or their community. Now, he is right in the sense that privacy is important. And the first thing I want to do is not to argue with him about privacy because I'm a private guy too and I want to be left alone and I want most people out of my life. So I'm not gonna argue with him about the importance of privacy, but privacy doesn't justify killing other human beings. He's assumed that the unborn are not like us. But he doesn't realize he's made that mistake. So I put my hand on my head. I said, sir, you're right. I'm a private guy too. I believe that privacy is important. I embrace that as well. So but imagine I have a two-year-old little girl standing next to me. And this cheerful little girl, she's, she's my neighbor's daughter. And imagine that I find out my neighbor is viciously abusing her every night in the privacy of their own home. It's happening in the privacy of their own home. He never does it in public. Never where anybody can see it. But her life within that house is one abusive episode after another. Would you be okay with empowering Child Protective Services and the community empowering them to go into that house, violate the privacy of that family to take that child out to protect them? And he says to me, well, of course I would. And so I asked this question, why? I said, what do you mean, why? I said, why? It's a private matter. It's happening in their home. He said, well, they can't do that. I said, why? It's happening in the privacy of their home. You just said that privacy is important. He said, well, that's not the same. So how is it not the same? And so I keep putting the pressure on him. I don't let him get off the hot seat. Why are we allowed to violate the privacy of my neighbor to protect that child? And he finally got frustrated and he said, Mr. Watts, privacy is not a justification for the abuse of other human beings. I agree with you. So, if the unborn are human in the same way that this child is, then however important we both acknowledge privacy is, it's not important enough to be able to kill another human being. You just said it's not a justification for the abuse of other human beings. So, what is the unborn? Why do you think they're different than that child that we just talked about? Well, we both agree that violation of privacy is perfectly reasonable when that child is being hurt. You can do this over and over again, many different ways. Trot out the toddler and let them see the mistake they're making. Another mistake they make is they assume, uh, they, they confuse objective claims with moral claims. I talked to you earlier about the objective importance of this issue. So what they'll say is, uh, I remember one time, you know, really quickly, I was speaking out in California again. This was in San Francisco. I get to see one of the great things about being in public, but I can't see now, but in person and giving presentations is I see the entire audience. And I see when people are listening. I see when people are sleeping. I see when they're playing with their phone. And I see when somebody hates me. It may surprise you to know, I don't care. As a matter of fact, most of the time, I really like it when somebody really genuinely hates me while I'm talking because I'm going to open up the floor for Q&A afterwards. And the people who hate me usually come to the mic pretty aggressively and want to ask questions. And that's good for dialogue. And so I see this one young lady, and man, at the time, she hated me more than anybody I'd ever seen in my life. I loved it. So as I was talking, I just kept checking in with her, making eye contact with her to make sure she's still there. Uh, and, and when it was over, she walks up to the mic and she's so angry. And I'm so ready to hear what she has to say because I know she's been sitting on this the entire time that I'm talking. And she said, Mr. Watts, if you don't like abortion, then don't have it. And I was crushingly disappointed. I mean, what a waste of hate, right? And so I looked at her and said, Miss young lady, I never said I don't like abortion, right? I don't like Pepsi. Uh, you know, there's things I don't like in this world. I don't like Pepsi. I don't like red squishy apples. I like Granny Smith apples. I like Coke. There's all sorts of things that you and I could talk about where I like things that you don't like and you like things that I don't. And that's perfectly acceptable, but I never said I don't like abortion. I said it's wrong. And that's a different argument altogether. That's an objective moral claim. Most people are morally sensitive enough, even in this, in this climate that we find ourselves living in, to understand that rape is objectively wrong. Raping a woman or raping anyone, a man or a woman, is wrong at all times, in all cultures, everywhere. It's wrong for all people. There's no extenuating circumstances where rape becomes acceptable. Rape is objectively wrong. 
And when I'm arguing that abortion is wrong, we're arguing into the category of child abuse and rape and these things where, where all of us agree. If I ever said, if you said to me, Mr. Wash, child abuse is wrong, and I said, hey, 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 you may not like child abuse, but I love it. So keep your laws off my body while I abuse my kids. You would know, I don't understand what you mean when you said it's wrong. And that's a mistake that people make that we have to help them understand. In our world, it's very common for people to mistake an objective moral claim for a preference claim, to believe they're saying something meaningful when they say, I like it or don't like it, and makes me feel good or makes me feel bad. But this is a discussion about what's right and what's wrong. And if we accept that rape is wrong, and we accept that child abuse is wrong, and we accept that murder is wrong, then we have to realize that we're talking about a category of argument where our personal feelings don't matter. When I tell you subjectively how I feel about something, I'm telling you something about me. When I ask the question, what is the unborn and why are we allowed to kill them? I'm asking you about something external to both of us. And as a reality, and, and how we feel about it doesn't matter. What is it? What are we talking about? Why do you think we're allowed to kill them? And why do I think that we should be restrained from that action? But neither one of us can answer that question by looking into our souls and determining how we feel or our emotional response to it. We have to answer it by answering that question about something very real that is a material reality and is external to us. What is it? Okay, so, so far we have talked about making a case for making a case, and we've talked about what the central question is. What is the unborn? And some mistakes that people make when they talk about this. But now we have to make our case. And making our case is a little more complicated oftentimes than people make it sound on the internet. I'll see people, uh, you can, like, I'm on, I'm not on Facebook anymore or on Twitter. I have accounts on them and I, I get on and check every once in a while, but people used to tag me in a lot of arguments they were having. And I would go and look and I would watch how people were arguing. And one of the things I would hear people say is that science confirms that unborn are human, so therefore abortion is wrong. Now science does play a role, but we have two components to this argument, science and philosophy. So we'll talk about what science does first, and then with philosophy we'll talk about what science doesn't quite do and why we need that philosophical component to the argument. The first part, though, is determining, of, of answering the question, what is it? What are the unborn? What is the human fetus? What is the human embryo? Why are we convinced as a society that we're allowed to kill them? To answer that question, the first question that we have to answer is, what is it biologically? Now, with this particular question, there is very little argument. Uh, when I, and we say, look, you know, from the moment it comes into existence, when I say that the unborn is a whole, distinct, and living human being, it is a whole, distinct human life from the moment it comes into existence, at that very first stage of development, when it's a single-celled organism, it is a whole and distinct living human. And there was almost no argument against this. Almost everybody agrees with what I just said. It is a human life. It is a whole human life. It is a life distinct from its mother or its father. And it is alive. So, as a matter of fact, when I say that, I used to always say almost nobody disagrees with this, but we didn't have raw numbers. And then Steve Jacobs, who is now with Illinois Right to Life, and his PhD thesis work at the University of Chicago, did several years research as he was looking to be an arbiter and find, is, is there some way, as part of his focus of his research, is there some way for us to ever come to some agreement about this issue, or are we hopelessly divided on the issue of abortion? So one of the things he did was he asked everybody, what do you think would answer the question, what is it? What would you think would be the de decisive answer? And most people, a high, very high percentage of people that he asked said that they would want to know biologically, is it a human life? And if that was true, that they would believe that we had responsibility or duties to it. This goes beyond just the philosophical question we'll get to later. Most people believe if it's human, we ought not to kill it. And then he, then he asked the next question, well, who should we ask? Who would you trust to give that answer? And again, a huge high percentage of the answers came back academic biologists. We should reach out to them and find out. If they confirm that it's a human life, then we should probably not kill it. As a matter of fact, he asked prior to that too what they thought the biologist would say, and almost everybody that he asked, or a high percentage of them, said that the biologist would, would affirm it's not human life. So he sent out research, or he sent out uh, questionnaires to biologists all over the country, more than 5,500, I believe, academic biologists at some of the most prestigious universities all over the world. 95% uh, of those biologists holding PhDs, uh, and of the responses that he got back, 
uh, which is again, is that he actually sent out far more than 5,500. 5,500 is the responses he got back. 96% of those people affirmed that life begins at fertilization, that a new organism comes into existence at fertilization. Now, I have an interview with Steve, uh, with Dr. Jacobs on my website, where he actually talks about this. One of the funny things that I think we're having that conversation is the question, what else could it be? It's whole, meaning that it's not a part of something else. There is some confusion between parts and wholes. I hear people sometimes ask about living cells. Sometimes they'll talk about sperm cells or egg cells, or maybe even tissue on our hand, like skin cells. They'll say, well, well, those are living cells. And in particular, my skin cells, each one of them has a full complement of my genetic material in it. They say, why aren't you worried about them dying? Why is it just this one particular cell that bothers you? Well, the answer is that those are parts, sperm, eggs, the cells on my skin, they're all constituent parts of another organism. They serve the purposes of this organism, of me. Uh, my skin cells, my sperm, the egg cells, and my wife, they're all cells that serve that whole, either the reproductive organs or reproductive system of that individual, or just the, the skin, the protective organ of my body. And so those are parts of a whole organism. From the moment they come into existence, though, the, the, the zygote, a single-celled organism, is an organism under themselves. As a matter of fact, the very first thing they do is self-protective action. The zona pellucida hardens or protects itself from environmental pressures that might destroy it early in life. It protects it, it goes through that early process of, of differentiation, cellular differentiation, size, cellular replication, all of those things going on early, very early in the life, and it's acting in a self-protective measure. Uh, it is, from the moment it comes into its existence, a whole life, not a part Part of something else. It is a distinct life. It has a different genetic makeup than either the mother or the father, unique uh, uh, for the first time in this world, something totally new coming into existence, whole and distinct, and it is alive. Uh, it has an internally driven uh, developmental process that it enters into early. It's very predictable developmental process, by the way, so that we can actually chart. I've been in oh, uh, the OBGYN offices, both for my family and then watching ultrasounds later on with other people where you see we're measuring the growth of its head so we can determine the age while we look at different parts of its body because we know there's such predictability in its advancement through its developmental uh, the development phases, that if we see something off, then we know something's wrong, or we're able to look at it and say, at this age, this is about how big they probably are. So they're probably this age based on the size they see. This is an eternally coordinated, internally driven development process that it's entered into. Now, when I say that almost nobody disagrees with that, I don't mean just pro-lifers, I mean pro-choice people as well. I'm gonna put on my glasses for a second so I can read this to you. But this is a quote from Peter Singer, one of the most famous pro-choice ethicists on the planet. And he says, it is possible to give human being a precise meaning. We can use it as equivalent to a member of the species Homo sapiens. Whether a being is a member of a given species is something that can be determined scientifically by an examination of the nature of the chromosomes and the cells of living organisms. In this sense, there is no doubt that from the first moments of its existence, an embryo conceived from human sperm and eggs is a human being. Dr. Michelin Matthews Roth, back in 1981, giving testimony, she was an associate professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, giving testimony for the Human Life Bill before a Senate Judiciary Committee, said, so therefore it is scientifically correct to say that an individual human life begins at conception when egg and sperm join to form the zygote, and this developing human always is a member of our species in all stages of its life. I said that we have almost no one who disagrees. Dr. Jacobs' research has a 96% of, bio, of biologists, of academic biologists, affirm this. And I just gave you two individuals, one of them, one of the most famous pro-choice philosophers on the planet, all of them saying what we just said. From the moment it comes into existence, a whole, a whole distinct and living human life has begun. Now, I talked about the difference between a confusion of parts and wholes. Very quickly, I want to talk about another thing that confuses us. And oftentimes, that's where we... We mistake, because we live in a world of constructed things, that the unborn are like a constructed thing, like a built thing, that you add things to them, and ultimately they become something of value. But very early on, they just don't have the pieces or the parts or whatever in order for us to consider them like us, one of us. The problem there is that we're, we're confusing a developing thing, which is what the unborn is, what the embryo is, what the fetus is. We're confusing that with built things, like all of the things that are being used right now 
for me to send this message to you guys. All of these are built things. All of these are constructed things. And if some part is not added or not put in place at some point, it will not function as a camera or a microphone or a light. My laptop won't function as a laptop. As a matter of fact, if you're in a building, you probably had to get a certificate of occupancy during the construction of that building. There had to be a point where it was built enough so that you could go to whatever governing body you had to appeal to and say, hey, is this okay for people to live in, dwell in, I work in whatever. Is this now approved? Is it now a habitable building? Because it makes sense when we're talking about things that we build to say at some point we add components that it becomes what we want it to be. But that's not what human life is. Human life develops in accordance with genetic material that's there from the moment it comes into existence and environmental pressures. And so we see something, it is not a human being that's being built or manufactured inside of a woman. It's a human being from the moment it comes into existence and it's developing in accordance with material or information that was there from the moment it came into existence. So much about me that you can see right now was there then, was already a part of me and carried it with me all through my life. I'm a developing thing and the genetic reality of what I am is expressed through that development and maturation process. I didn't become a human being because something added to me that made me a human. My humanity was expressed because I was given time to mature and the environment, the proper nourishing environment to grow in. So when we talk about what is a human being, the first question is, it is human from the moment it comes into existence. What is the unborn? It is a human from the moment it comes into existence. It's a whole and distinct human life from that very first moment. We're not parts of any things. We're whole from the moment we come into existence. We're not built or constructed things. We're developing things. If we clear those things up, we will see that scientifically, the, the science of embryology tells us the first part of question answering that question, what is the unborn? It is a human life from the moment it comes into existence. So science tells us from the moment they come into existence, they're whole distinct living human beings. But that doesn't get us all the way there. Now, a lot of people think it does. A lot of people in instinctively online or intuitionally understand that if we can just demonstrate that they are human, that it is a human life we're talking about, then we have some duty or responsibility to them and that abortion seems wrong at that point. And Dr. Jacob's research seemed to verify it as well, that, that intuitionally is the way most people feel. But there's a problem there, right? Because science has told us materially what we're talking about. This is a new human organism that's come into existence, and there's no other point to argue with this. What else could they be? From the moment they come into existence, it is a new human organism. But the question is, what moral duties or responsibilities do we have to that human organism? And that's not going to be answered by science, because it can only tell us what it is. How I ought to treat it, once we start talking about oughts, O-U-G-H-T, how I ought to treat it, we introduce the subject of morality. So I ask people a question to try to find out where they are and where we agree and disagree on morality, whether or not we're operating on the same foundation. And I say, hey, would it be objectively wrong for you and I to kill each other right here? For just for no reason, for you and I just to kill each other? Almost everyone I've ever asked that question of says, yes, of course, that would be objectively wrong. Now that means we share a lot about how we understand the moral nature of human beings and our relationships to other people. Even though we're strangers, we agree we should not kill each other because killing each other is wrong. So the next question I ask to get us further along is, okay, so if we both agree that it's wrong to kill other human beings, it would be wrong for you and I to kill each other, what changed? What changed from the embryo or fetus that you once were to the more mature human being standing in front of me now that if I killed you then, it would be a legally protected right. It's something that you believe that I ought to, every woman have ought the right to do, and every abortionist I ought, ought, ought to have the right to do as well. What change? Because they have to explain that change of state. So what they're saying is at this moment, right before whatever they're going to say attains in that life, that I can do anything I want to them. I can tear them to pieces. I can vacuum them out of something. I can poison them. I can burn them. I can do anything that I want, and nothing that I do to them is wrong because they're not the kind of human that's capable of being wrong. And then they're going to say, but then X, Y, or Z happens. And as a result of that, now, if I did the exact same thing to them that I did to them a moment ago, that I would have been allowed to do them a moment ago, it would be the worst thing that I could do to another human being. It would make me a moral monster to do that to another human being. What could possibly explain that change of state? Because that's a dramatic philosophical change of state that they're offering there. And philosopher Stephen Schwartz says, that the answer that they give you will qualify into one of four categories, which he called the SLED acronym, size, level of development, environment, or degree of dependency. 
He said, they're going to say one of those four things, size, level of development, environment, or degree of dependency, because that's, that covers everything. And he says, as important as all of those things are, not a single one of those is sufficient to justify the change of state that we just talked about, the moral change of nature that we talked about. None of those. You got bigger. You could do more things. You changed where you are. You are less dependent than you were. None of those will explain or justify morally what I could do to you now, or what I could do to you then, what I could never do to you now. None of those will do that work necessary. Size is a great place to look at degreed properties because we get bigger and our size changes and everybody's size is different. If you walk around, you'll notice that none of us are exactly the same size and we're all different and changing during the course of our lives and we're surrounded by people of different size. Even in my own house, my son is, is the biggest at 6'2". Uh, my daughter is just the youngest, is just a little bit over 5'2", I believe. And there's some variation between all of us in there. There's some big people, there's some skinnier people, and there's everything in between. And just in our house, all these different sizes, but not different value. Because value is something we see as intrinsic. It's something that all human beings share. And when we look at cultures and other communities, and we look at things going on, we see injustice. If we look at Yemen, or we look at the Uyghur population in China, or we look at what happened in the Sudan, we look even at our own culture and see injustice in certain communities. And we point to that and say, it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter your ethnicity, your religion, your location, your, 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 the political reality of the life that you live in. No matter what, you shouldn't be treated like that. We appeal to something that all human beings share equally. And degreed properties are by their nature differing, not just among us, but even in the course of our life. I'm more awake, less awake, more aware, less aware, bigger, smaller. But value is something that we all seem to have the same of. And the only place to ground that would be in the place where we all share something equally. And that's our shared humanity. And so most people don't look at small people or big people and judge them by value. So size doesn't really come into it as much. Level of development does. A lot of people will say things like you have to have a heartbeat or brain waves, organized cortical brain activity, or uh, organ independence from the mother, ability to survive outside of the womb, viability, uh, or the idea of just being born, or conscious awareness, which happens well after birth. So let's see any one of those things. Now, if there's two questions we need to ask. Number one is who empowered you to divide a line between the human family and say every human being, every human life that can't do X, Y, or Z or doesn't have X, Y, or Z, we are free to kill as much as we want. And every human life that can or does have X, Y, and Z, we must respect. And it would be wrong to kill them. Who gave any other human being the authority to divide the human family like that? Who empowered them to draw a line and say, we can kill them, but not them? And then the second question I have to ask is, how can I ever trust that you got that right? How can I ever trust that you have correctly diagnosed the situation? Because we both acknowledge that it would be immoral for us to kill each other, but you're telling me I'm allowed to kill them. And if you're wrong, you're inviting me into great injustice. As a matter of fact, with the numbers that we talked about at the beginning of this talk, massive, deep injustice. How can I ever trust that you're right? How can I risk my own moral conscience on your opinion that I'm allowed to do this. Who gave you the right to divide us? And how can I trust the idea that you correctly divided us? So any level of development argument that you give me has got to bear the weight of those questions. Finally, you got the environment where you are. Where you are is not what you are, as Peter Singer, who thinks it's okay to kill newborns because he says, hey, look, the same properties that they lack when they're in the side of the mother, they lack when they're born. So if we can kill them there, we can kill them here. So the environment doesn't change what you are. He said, where you are is not what you are, and what you are is what makes you valuable. I agree with him, by the way. I just disagree with his conclusions about newborns. I think that most people still understand that there is something morally wrong with killing newborns. And we don't have to wait for them to attain something later in life for us to restrain from killing them. And if we can accept that we shouldn't kill newborns, then Peter Singer's right. We should not kill them before they're born, because he's absolutely correct that they're the same thing. And then finally, degree of dependency. We look at other beings, like my daughter's a type 1 diabetic. She used to be deeply and powerfully independent. Never wanted help from anybody. Then all of a sudden, eight years old, she was diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic. And now our family has to be involved with all sorts of decisions that she makes. And we have to know things about her that other girls and other people growing up, your parents just never know. No, none of your parents, if you don't have a type 1 diabetic or a diabetic in the house, no parents know what the blood glucose level of their kids is from moment to moment. But in our household, we're painfully aware of it because if we mess up, she won't survive the night sometimes. Her dependence is high. She needs the people around her to help her live. To say nothing of the medical dependence on, on insulin, but 
That doesn't mean it's a lesser offense to kill her, I hope. I hope we don't look at other human beings who need our help and think, well, you need more help, and so killing you is less a big deal. As a matter of fact, traditionally in Christian ethics, when we saw people who had greater need, we saw greater opportunity for service, greater duty, greater obligation, and greater responsibility. We didn't look at those people who needed us more and said, ooh, that's tough, man. Your value just went way down. We looked at them and said, this is our opportunity to show our own grace and mercy and love and to make this, this, this community more inclusive by bringing you in and embracing you fully as one of us, and I will sacrifice for you. Size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency. They don't explain why we could kill you then, but not now. Not sufficiently, because that's just a massive change of state. So finally, I want to say very quickly, how we argue about this matters. I was once on the other side of this. I was once a person who believed in the right to abortion. And I know a lot of people who I love who still do. And I want to argue in a way that opens up room for them to change. You see, I think being right matters, not just because it feels better to be right, to be away from error and move towards the truth, but also because the society needs people to join the ranks of those who have a deep and abiding respect for people around them. But right now, in this world that we live in, it can become very easy to be drawn in to all of the emotions that we feel as we fight these things out politically and to ramp up the rhetoric and divide humanity up in the same way so that's good guys and bad guys. And we can win arguments about abortion and lose the people with whom we're arguing. And I desperately want us to win people with good arguments. It's not always possible, but to the best that we can, we need to win people over to our view, not just so that we can win and get the laws that we want passed and enacted, but so that we can have a society that treats all of its members better and consider, deeply considers our obligations and duties to one another. We would be great hypocrites, terrible hypocrites, if we took a message to the world that every human being has intrinsic dignity and value and hated people for disagreeing with us. So to sum up, we have an obligation and duty to talk. We need to focus like a laser on the central issue that decides whether or not abortion is right or wrong, and that is how we answer the question, what is the unborn? We need to look for where the people who are arguing with us make mistakes in how they process this. Are they assuming that the unborn are the kind of thing they're allowed to, tell, to kill? Are they assuming uh, that, that saying their emotional state or their feelings about something is the same as arguing about it, mistaking objective moral claims and confusing them with preference claims? Or are they just simply yelling things at each other? And then finally, we argue for our position using science and philosophy. The science of embryology demonstrates from the moment they come into existence, they're whole distinct and living human beings. And philosophy tells us the best explanation for experience and intuition of universal human dignity, shared equal dignity among all human beings that transcends race and ethnicity and governments. The only explanation for this thing that we all share equally is that it's grounded in something that we share equally. And the only thing that we all share equally is our shared humanity. And so our value, our intrinsic value, our equal human dignity is grounded there and not in size, level of development, environment, or degree of dependency. None of those do enough philosophical work to explain why we could kill you then, but we can't kill you now. I hope you all are now much more confident about defending your pro-life beliefs and are ready to have these conversations with your friends, family members, classmates, even strangers on the street. But along those lines, I know that it can be difficult to start those conversations and it can be tricky to know how to do so. So Jay, do you have any tips about how to begin a conversation about abortion? Yeah, I'd, I'd say... One of the things we want to do is you hear, and I've actually written an article about the term safe space. So I don't want to use it in a way that's going to upset people because, but you really do conversationally want to create a safe place for people to share their views. Uh, you have to be patient. Greg Kokel talks about the idea of, of taking the, the pressure off of the conversation in his book Tactics, which I think everybody should read if they want to be able to handle these conversations better. So one of the things I try to tell people when they come to me and say, I'm struggling, I don't know how to have a conversation about this. Every time I have a conversation with somebody, it gets ugly. I ask them two things. Say, so number one, 
how much are you burdening the other person with what you believe in the conversation early in the conversation? How, how much is your view dominating the conversation early? It should be way in the back, right? The first thing we need to do is find out what the person we're talking to believes. And the only way to do that is to ask them. And so we give them all the room in the world. And oftentimes when I'm talking to somebody, even after I've given a talk, they know who I am and what I believe, right? Or in, in shortly in conversations, usually people find out anyway. But when I'm having a conversation with them, I say, do me a favor. I, say, I know what I believe. I, I know what I believe. I don't need you to help me to understand what I believe. But do me a favor. Help me to understand what you believe. What are the unborn? What is the unborn that you believe what we're doing to them through the process of abortion is okay? Because it's inarguable what we're doing. Everybody knows exactly what we're doing to them. That's not, that's not up for debate. The question of debate is always going to be, what are they? Are they members of the, are full members of the human family? Are they one of us? So I tell them, I think they're one of us. You know that. But what do you think they are? I mean, they're, they're unarguably humans. So what is it about their humanity? What kind of human are they that you think it's okay to do what we're doing to them? And that, that gives them the freedom to talk about it. And that's an important thing because you get, I talk to the talk, you'll, you'll get a lot of ground by asking questions while they say their beliefs instead of feeling the pressure to throw your beliefs on top of everything that they say. Uh, I'm not at fear of being convinced I'm wrong in this conversation. I'm trying to see if there's some error I can help correct somebody with uh, and where they're thinking. And so I want to hear as much as they're thinking as possible so we can find that place where there may be a little bit of corruption in how they're processing this. And then to gently remind them of that when it comes up. And also, if you talk over people, you invariably miss the power of, of someone saying something wrong and them hearing it themselves. And it's amazing how much work that does for you sometimes in a conversation where I remember a young man at University of Georgia that I was having a conversation with. And he came up to the conversation completely pro-choice. Everything that I said was wrong. And then after he heard himself talk for a while and I would ask him, did you mean to say that? Is that what you actually meant to say about life or what were our obligations or duties to them? And this was a very short conversation, by the way. I think like eight minutes into it, all of a sudden this young man said, you're right. And I said, I'm, I'm right about what I'm right about that specific point I just made. And he said, no, you're right about everything. But I didn't realize that until I just heard me saying these things. And as I heard these things coming out of my mouth, I realized how awful they were. But I've never said them. I've only thought them. And so that's a valuable tool as well in dialogue. The more they hear themselves saying things that they don't like, the better it is in moving them towards a, a better position with this. Yes, I agree. It's so important to ask questions. I think it kind of takes off the, the pressure as well, because all you're trying to do is better understand their position. Um, you don't have to be worried about like getting into a, a debate and yeah. like, getting prepared for it. Um, and you want to interact with what they believe, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, when I've seen people sit there and rail on somebody for like 10 minutes, and then when they got over the person that they were just talking to said, yeah, but I don't think any of that. You know, that's none of those are the reasons why I hold the position that I hold. And, and so you also save yourself some time, right? There's no reason to try to run ahead of them and start making claims on their behalf. Let them make their own claims and, and give them a chance to do that. Absolutely. So you mentioned previously about, um, at the time, not really believing in objective morality, absolute rights and wrongs, and how that kind of influenced your conversion. So that was actually one of the questions that one of our youth had. And that's how do you respond to someone who thinks that right and wrong are simply constructs created to preserve a law and order and thus our species. Yeah. And that because abortion is kind of hidden and doesn't really cause mass hysteria, that it's okay. Well, th that's, a, that's a big deal, right? I, I tell people a lot when you have that conversation, if somebody doesn't believe in the existence of objective moral values, one of the things we talk about in the talk is I ask people that question. When I say, um, would it be objectively wrong for you and I to kill each other right now, right? And so we know that if they say no, that there's no reason to talk to them at all about abortion because they don't think killing anybody's wrong, right? And so now we have to discuss, there's, there's ways to have a conversation with somebody like that. Number one is to point out that it's basically unlivable. They don't really believe that. Uh, they don't really genuinely believe that there's nothing objectively wrong you can do to another human being. I've had conversations with people that want to argue that point, but I'll ask them, well, do you think it's wrong to rape a woman? Because most morally functioning people understand that that's objectively wrong, that it's wrong for all people at all times everywhere. And it's not just a construct. You just 
ought not to ever do that to another human being. And when they say, well, I personally think it's wrong. Who am I to tell somebody else what they can do? They hear themselves say that again. And so does anybody listening, by the way, which doesn't go well for that position. Do you think genocide is wrong? Well, I am personally against it because that's what it's all going to come down to, right? What I subjectively believe, how I emote, how I feel about it, or, or what I think is in my personal opinion, but none of it applies to anybody else. And as I went through this list with people saying, do you think this is wrong? Do you think this is wrong? Do you think this is wrong? They all say the same thing. I think it's wrong. But who am I to tell other people they can't do that? I think it's wrong. But who am I to tell other people they can't do that, right? I think that's wrong. And so finally, I'll ask them. It's amazing, right? You don't believe in an objective morality, but you and I agree on almost every moral point. It's almost as if it were true for all people, you and me. And, and sometimes people will bite bullets in order to be able to preserve their integrity in a particular conversation. They're willing to bite that bullet, but they lose a lot from the pro-choice position if they actually bite the bullet and say there's no such thing as objective moral values, there's only social constructs. As then I point out to them, well, then there's nothing wrong with restricting women's access to abortion, not objectively speaking. I mean, now who wins? It's just a matter of pure political power. I'm not wrong for seeking the pro-life side, and you're not wrong for seeking the pro-choice side. Whoever wins this argument will be the person that convinces the most people they're correct. And any woman that now has no access to the to that uh, to, to abortion has not been wronged in any way because there's no such thing as right and wrong. And any any time you go to another country and say that other country ought to get their abortion laws in line with what the United States has because freedom is good, but who cares about all of that? That's just construct, right? Everybody has the right to make up their own thing, and nobody has the right now to appeal to anything by virtue of I have a right to do, do this and it's wrong for you to stop me from doing this or having access to it. It's all now just a measure of raw political power. And so you be pro-choice, I'll be pro-life, I'll convince everybody as best I can that I'm right, you convince everybody as best you can that you're right, but there is no longer anyone allowed to make an appeal to justice on this. You don't get to say, if you lose the right to abortion, that you've lost something you ought to have because you forfeited that when you said there's no such thing as objective moral values to begin with. Now, every exercise in politics is no longer seeking a real justice, but only the justice is defined by any particular people at any particular moment. So now not only are you living something completely unlivable or claiming to believe something completely unlivable because you believe that there are right and wrongs in this world and you operate like that every single day as you meet up with other people in society, but you've reduced your own position to nothing more than an opinion held by a few people. And if it can be overcome by a larger group of people, so be it. There are no justice issues any longer. It's just po politics. I found that was a really, really great answer. So um, just thank you so much, Jay, for the invaluable education that you've provided us. I, I'm really looking forward to seeing our youth put it into action. Thank you so much for letting me be a part of this. It's a privilege. Just as a reminder, we will be learning more about how to talk about abortion from Will Witt of PragerU later on this youth conference. So make sure you stick around. And then if you registered early enough in advance for the youth conference, you should have been emailed a link to a small group meeting to happen at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. And you're definitely free to talk more about pro-life apologetics and what you can do to become active in the pro-life movement. Um, with your fellow small group members and your small group leader. So make sure you participate in that if you have the chance. So our next speaker is Joseph Backholm. Joseph, thank you so much for being a part of I Am With You, the 2021 National March for Life Youth Conference. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you, Jesse. So Joseph, you do have a very extensive resume, which I'm just going to roll through. Uh, you're currently the Senior Fellow for Biblical Worldview and Strategic Engagement at Family Research Council. Previously, you were the Director and Legal Counselor, Counsel for What Would You Say at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview, and that is a YouTube channel, What Would You Say, that I'd highly recommend that all of our youth check out. It has some really solid content, and then of course, prior to that, you were the president and general counsel for the Family Policy Institute of Washington. But I think yes. your greatest accomplishment is identifying as a six foot five Chinese woman. So, Joseph, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, I, I, I hope that is, in fact, not my greatest accomplishment. But yes, it is uh, perhaps the one that people most quickly recognize. And that was a, 
that was a series of interviews I did at my alma mater, the University of Washington, um, testing the logic essentially of gender identity and, and this idea that, that identity is identified rather than realized or acknowledged. And, and I asked a series of questions about uh, whether I could be a woman, and I knew what the answer to that was going to be, but then whether I could be Chinese, whether I could be seven years old, whether I could be six feet five, and though I'm sitting here in a chair, I assure everyone uh, watching that if I was standing in front of you, you would quickly recognize that I am not six foot five. And so it, it was a video that I think touched a nerve a little bit um, because it, it exposed the logic of this idea that reality is something we determine for ourselves. And if we want to claim that is true about one area of our lives, what is the limiting principle? At what point are we not allowed to choose our own reality? And they had a very difficult time coming up with any limits, which is why it's uh, both funny and scary. Yes, I found it was super clever. It's another one of the videos that I'd highly recommend you check out after the youth conference. Um, but right now, Joseph is going to talk to us about how political issues like abortion and euthanasia are not so much about politics as they are about which underlying worldview we choose to adopt. So I am super excited for this talk. I don't want to delay any further. Let's just jump right into it. Well, Josie, thank you for the chance to be with you. Thank you for the invitation. It really is a pleasure to be with you. I do in particular enjoy talking to younger people. I used to feel like I was a younger person and those days are gone. So I think I maybe vicariously feel younger when I spend time with younger people doing this. So thank you for the chance uh, to be with you in this event and really for the commitment to the life issue, not just the abortion issue, but the life issue and, and the breadth and all that that represents. Um, I care about this stuff um, and, and I also care about the conversation we're going to have right now. And I really am grateful that you're going to allow this to happen. Because for me, uh, this really, the, the political space, the abortion issue, the life issue, the marriage issue, the religious freedom issue, whatever you want to talk about, these really are not, in my mind, political issues. And I'm going to try to explain uh, why that is today. And they always get that label. And frankly, it's one of the reasons why it's hard to get the church to engage with these issues and with the culture is because of the sense that, well, we don't do politics, quote unquote. But I hope by the time, end of my time today that I will be able to convince uh, you guys that this is really much more than politics. And because of that, uh, we should be involved. We should care. Now, this isn't going to be everyone's life passion, and I understand that. But it should be something that we understand matters and we can't be apathetic or indifferent to. And that's really my goal uh, for today, why this isn't about politics. Now, in order to make that case, I want to start at the very beginning, and I mean the be beginning of the creation and also the beginning of scripture. In Genesis 1 and 2, we see a perfect world as God intended it. Sin enters the world in Genesis chapter 3. So the first two chapters of the Bible describe a world that is perfect. And what we see there is what God intended for his perfect world, a world in which no one was in, living in rebellion to him. What are the components? What did he intend uh, the world to be like in order to have human flourishing, in order to have his creation, the crown of his creation being us, in order to have a whole universe and a world that honored him, that glorified him, that lived and existed as he intended perfectly without sin. And there's a few components to this that I want to um, that I want to focus in on to help people understand this. And if you have your Bible, you can follow through in the first couple chapters of Genesis 1 and 2. You'll see where these things show up. But if you don't, uh, that's okay because the big picture here will probably be um, familiar to you. Now, the origin of man's rebellion, and I just talked about this, is in Genesis chapter 3, where the serpent, and often characterized, Satan is often characterized as a snake, um, but says, comes in and asks Eve this question, did God really say that you should not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? And that really is the question that introduced sin and rebellion into the world. Did God really say? Can we trust what God said is true? 
And of course, we know that Eve um, became convinced that maybe she, in fact, knew better than God. And we see the rationalization in the first two chapters there of Genesis 3, or the first few verses of Genesis chapter 3, where she says, well, it's desirable to make one wise. It's a delight to the eyes, referring to this fruit that she wanted to eat. She ultimately convinced herself that though God had told her not to do it, it was actually best for her to do it. And that is when sin entered the world. But what was it like before that happened? Well, and here's some of the things that we're, we're conflicted about, where God says he created the male and female. And these are the first few things in, in Genesis 1 and 2. God describes the world first as he created us male and female. Now, we know that that, that idea is hotly debated in the culture. Did he create us male and female or not? And again, the question is, did God really say? We see in Genesis chapter 1 that male and female, he created them. And he created us, which means we don't determine that for ourselves. He determined that for us. But we see the question asked now, just like in Genesis chapter 3, did God really say? Is that really what he meant? Or is gender actually binary? Maybe there's a difference between sex and gender, and both of which can be fixed, but neither of which... Uh, forms our identity because we can determine our identity um, for ourselves based on our feelings. So even if you're created with male biology, it doesn't necessarily mean you're a man. You can be a woman because sometimes you get the wrong brain into the wrong body. Therefore, God was wrong when he said he creates us male and female because sometimes there are people with male anatomy who are actually women, right? That's the rationalization did God really say? But we know that in Genesis chapter 1, God said he created us male and female. Then he said, after he created us male and female, put us together in marriage, he said, be fruitful and multiply. Be fruitful and multiply. That was a command he gave to humanity. But we also know that the idea that people should multiply and have children is hotly debated today. And it is part of this debate over the abortion issue. And so this is a, a uh, perhaps offensive um, uh, image here that I'm sharing with you on the screen. Save the planet, use a condom. What is the idea here? Is that children are a problem. People are a problem. They are a threat. They are not, as God says, the crown of his creation. But they are the threat to the planet, and it's much more important that we take care of the planet than that we take care of people. So again, we see the way that God structured this. We want you to get together and have children. They're saying, actually, uh, children and people are a problem. They're the real threat. What else? Uh, and, and we see another way that God says this. God said, okay, we created you male and female. Be fruitful and multiply. Then go rule and subdue the earth. Be fruitful and multiply. That's part of this. And ruling and subduing, which means, uh, you know, taking all the product out of the earth and making things like iPhones and televisions and airplanes and rockets and medicine and insulin and all the things that we have done out of the raw ingredients of the earth. And we make gardens and we make buildings and we make cities and highways and trains and all of these things. That were, that were derived out of the raw ingredients of the earth and we combined human intelligence and creativity, we have ruled and subdued the earth because that's how God intended it to be. He is himself a creator, which is why he created us, and he intends us to be creators because we are made in his image and that's part of ruling and subduing the earth. But there are very different um beliefs about this idea that humans should rule and subdue the earth. And what we see here is one of those, save the planet, kill yourselves. Again, because it's seen that people are the real threat, not the not the blessing, not the reflection of God on earth, but they are the threat to the earth. And in that paradigm, the earth is more valuable than the people um, because they don't have a biblical perspective on this. But in every case, in, in, in these instances and, and, and many others that we'll talk about, um, the same question is being asked as was asked in Genesis chapter 3. Did God really say? Now, uh, in order to make these kind of big picture uh, ideas about male and female and rulings of doing and be fruitful and multiply more relevant and, and perhaps more timely, um, this slogan is something that probably everyone here will recognize. My body, my choice. And for the most part, it's something that is associated with the issue of abortion. Because 
one of the great defenses um, in support of abortion is the idea that somebody else should not be able to tell some another person what to do with their body. So the, the slogan is "My body, my choice" in or in, in defense of abortion. But I submit that it has a lot more to do with a lot of other things. And on this. Uh, Imagery here is typically something that people would uh, associate with homosexuality, same-sex attraction, perhaps the issue of gay marriage. But the idea represented in this image is not really fundamentally different than what I just showed you a moment ago with my body, my choice. In fact, it's the same argument, though it's most commonly used in defense of abortion. What we have here is people saying that because I belong to myself, and, and because uh, I am in control of myself, because it's my body, therefore I get to choose what I want to do with it. And if it makes me happy to uh, be romantically involved with somebody of the same sex, then I should have the ability to do that and no one else should be able to tell me not to. It's my body, my choice, right? Same basic argument. We see it here on the gender issue as well, um, where it's the idea that it's my body, I belong to myself, my body in one sense doesn't make me happy, therefore I have the right to alter my body because I belong to myself, I am autonomous, I am in control of myself, there is no authority above me that I am obligated to submit to, there is no truth beyond my feelings that is controlling over me, therefore my body my choice, if I am a man, or I'm born uh, as a man and I don't want to be a man anymore, I don't have to be because my body, my choice. The issue of physician-assisted suicide is one that, that, that the life issue, that the, the life community uh, continues to deal with and will more and more as we move forward. It's the same fundamental arguments that we see in all these other issues. That I belong to myself, the primary purpose of my existence is to be happy. And once I get sick, whether it's physically or emotionally or mentally, whatever it is, and I have d decided that my body is no longer a source of joy, it's no longer a source of satisfaction, that my life is no longer a source of joy, why should I not have the right to end my life? And why should a doctor not be able to help me with that? Because that's actually what's going to bring me peace. That's actually what's going to bring me healing is to kill me. And again, because I'm not subject to any other th truth beyond me, then that should be something I have the right to do. My body, my choice. We see this in this other issue of uh, the, we uh, of legalizing what they would refer to as sex work, what others would refer to as prostitution. In some cases, we're just dealing with sex trafficking. But the idea that as, a, as an individual, we have the right to sell our bodies for sexual purposes uh, if we are doing so uh, voluntarily and if we uh, like the money that we get for it or we even enjoy what, we, what it is that we're doing, that it's wrong to tell somebody they should not be able to sell their body because, again, my body, my choice. So we have these range of issues that are not obviously connected when it comes to assisted suicide and abortion and transgenderism and the decriminalization of prostitution, right? It's not obvious how these are all connected. But when we look a little higher, when we look at the big picture of, of, of ideas, we see that they are very much connected by this theme of my body, my choice. Now, I hope what all of this uh, demonstrates initially is that these ideas are connected and fundamentally they're not political. They are, they are, uh, and really the statement, my body, my choice is a, is a uh, statement of faith in much way the Nicene Creed or whatever statement of faith that you subscribe to is. It is a declaration of reality, my body, my choice. I belong to myself, therefore I can do whatever I want. And because this is true, we start talking about politics. Um, when we say we don't want to uh, get involved in political issues and all those issues that we do, just went through would be described by most people as political issues. But fundamentally, they're not political issues and I hope that becomes clearer now. And politics itself, and when I mean politics, and I've worked in that system a long time, is politics is really a process. It is not an issue. Politics does not describe a, a kind of issue. It describes a process through which 
all issues are debated. So whether it's economic issues, whether it's uh, you know business climate issues, whether it's environmental issues, whether they are explicitly moral issues, things like abortion and marriage, things like that. Or you can have really benign things that almost nobody cares about. And I actually, in a past life, staffed the Transportation Committee in the Washington State Legislature as an attorney. And we covered all sorts of uh, like questions like the regulation for uh, school bus storage sheds, which is something that basically no one cares about. But it is an issue that the state legislature gets involved with sometimes. And do people debate them hotly? No, because almost no one cares. But it is an issue that is discussed in the political process. And so the point here is to help people understand that when we say, I don't get involved in politics, that's usually an excuse to avoid hard conversations. And because politics is a process that, sim that, that can be used to debate any kind of issue, a moral issue, a religious issue, a business issue, a parenting issue, any of those, the political process can be used. But for our purposes now, the political politics is a process through which we debate competing views of reality. And that's what I really want to have be clear as we focus in on this when we see my body, my choice, and what that is in competition with. Because my body, my choice, because it is a statement of faith, is an, it, it's an assertion of what reality is. And there are, of course, different views. But once we believe that we are smarter than God, and these are the alternatives that you have in, in, from a Christian worldview and then a secular worldview, and we're going to, in a moment, dig in more carefully into what those things are. But these competing views of reality, you see in Galatians chapter 5, and I, I'm not going to have the time to go through it right now, but I encourage you to read this when, when we're done with this time. Um, because it describes the fruit of the Spirit and the deeds of the flesh. And for Christians, we are to walk in the fruit of the Spirit as the Holy Spirit lives in us. The outworking of that love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Those are the fruit of the Spirit. But we also see the deeds of the flesh, which are the result of believing that we are smarter than God. Of the, the result of believing that we are in control, the result of believing that it is my body, my choice. As soon as we adopt that as the theme for our lives... That means that we are now in control of ourselves. We are submitted to nothing. And that is ultimately the, the, um, the countercultural assertion, one of them, that, that Christianity makes, is that because we are not in control of ourselves, we are in submission to God. And it is highly offensive to a lot of people. And it is, in fact, difficult to live out because none of us uh, are without the urge to be in control. But this is the claim that Christianity makes. And the fruit of the Spirit is definitely better than the deeds of the flesh, and Scripture is full of examples of that. And Galatians 5 does a good job of describing what that looks like. But this sets up the next part of our conversation, because, because we're dealing with the fruit of the Spirit or the deeds of the flesh, we should see, if the Bible is not true, what we should see is that all of the, the culture, the secular culture's claims to reality, the idea that whether it comes to uh, sexuality, when it comes to gender, when it comes to abortion, a physician-assisted suicide, when it comes to legalization of things like um, prostitution, that if it is true that we are in control, that my body, my choice is the right way to live, then the more that we embrace each one of those things, we should see greater happiness. Because uh, according to the secular world's worldview, um, suppression of our desires, suppression of what we want is the key to misery, but celebration of those things is the key to joy. That's what they would tell us. So we should see where there is more autonomy, where there is more licentiousness, where there is more indulgence of our desires, that should lead to happiness. Conversely, if the Bible is true, though, if God, if, if, if the view of reality that we see described in the Bible, where God is in charge, we are not in charge, he understands the key to human flourishing, and he has given us the rules to describe what that means for us, and the extent to which we abide by those will determine the extent to which we achieve our purpose, then, if the Bible is true, all of those rebellions would lead to pain. 
and I will just pose this question to you. And of course, we're not going to talk about it at the moment, uh, maybe a little later. But this, uh, just think in your own life. The people who are indulging their desires most aggressively, are they realizing joy and happiness and satisfaction and contentment in their life? Or are they discovering pain? And uh, certainly I know it's true in my life and the social science data is actually quite clear on this, that the, the degree to which people indulge um, behaviors and activities and belief systems that God said is not good for them, it is not leading uh, to communities that are flourishing and that are thriving and that are suddenly finding joy where they once found pain. And in fact, the more we indulge those things, the more pain, the more suffering that we are seeing. And that is also great evidence of the fact that God was right in the first place. But let's put all some of this uh, into context of the rest of our life and understand what worldview is here. So as we experience life, because it's, it's important, um, that we want to have a biblical worldview, and I'm going to talk about what that is. Um, but I also want you to understand that the goal is not just to have a biblical worldview. And as we are all navigating through life and the things that we have in common, there are indisputable truths, um, ideas, experiences, the fact that we are all born, uh, we're all going to die. We have to navigate that uh, for ourselves. What we want to do is not simply believe the right thing. We want to, as you'll see there on the right side of your screen, we want to do the right thing. The goal of a disciple is to live the way God wants us to. And whether we are able to process life to the point where we do the right thing with what happens to us is a function of several things, one of which is our worldview. And our worldview is a set of assumptions, and that's what I'm going to talk about. Set of assumptions about what is true. And I want to introduce this to you just so we understand what we're talking about when we say worldview. This, uh, this cartoon here, I think, does a good job of describing it for me, of, of worldview, because these two guys are arguing about this digit that they discovered on the floor. Presumably they discovered it, but one of them looks at it and says it's a six and the other stands on the other side and says it's a nine. And there are different ways to uh, resolve this debate. Is one of them wrong? Is one of them right? Is one of them, are they both right or are they both wrong, right? These are some of the possible uh, answers to this question, but it really will depend on the assumptions which you come into this scenario with. And that's what forms worldview and that's what I want to talk about. Our worldview, which are things that most everyone has, but most people are not consciously aware of them, they really are our assumptions about origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. That's what frames our worldview. And let's talk about what each of these are just a little bit. Our assumptions about origin, the question of where did I come from? And we all know that there's different answers to this question. Where did I come from? Some people would say, well, uh, God created you. And that's what he described in Genesis 1 and 2. Other people would say, well, you are the product of um, many, uh, almost miraculous, but because they weren't purposeful, they weren't miraculous, mutations that led from an amoeba uh, forming out of a mud puddle, probably some kind of natural process turned non-life into life. And then that life over the course of billions of years and lots of uh, mutations ultimately led to, you know, you and we're using technology to talk to each other from a, across the expanses, right? That we came, our lives are an accident. We came from a series of accidents and is isn't that just amazing? So those are, for the most part, the two competing views of where we came from. Now, some people believe that we uh, we were reincarnated, but ultimately that begs another question of where did you come from initially, even if you were reincarnated? So th these are the, the assumptions that people make about origin. And of course, if you believe that your life is an accident and that your life is without purpose, that has meaning and that will influence what you think uh, in ways that are different than someone who believes that their life was purposeful and that they were created uh, exactly the way they were intended to be as who they are for a specific purpose in their life. Different assumptions, right? So then we have the question of meaning. Does my life matter and why? Now, 
the question of meaning is connected to the question of origin, of course, because if you believe that you were not created, that you came from an accident, then it makes sense that your life does not have intrinsic meaning. It does not have purposeful meaning. It does not have created meaning. Now, that doesn't mean that people who are atheists think that their life can't have meaning, and sometimes they would argue that, well, my life has meaning that I give it. If something is meaningful to me, therefore it has meaning. So if I get meaning by serving other people, then I can get meaning from that. If I get meaning from pleasure and from joy, then that gives my life meaning. So it can have meaning. Or some people would say, if I have meaning by being in control and being a world dictator, then that's how I get meaning. So yes, my life can have meaning. Um, but what we assume about, um, uh, about origins often has a lot to do with what we think about meaning. But everybody, uh, there, there are philosophies, uh, there are Gnostics in the world, there are Stoics who essentially say nothing in life is meaningful, nothing in life matters. So simply get all the pleasure you can because that's the best that you can hope for. Then you have the question of morality. How do I know what is right and wrong? And there are many different answers to this question. Some would say God determines what is right and wrong. Some would say I determine what is right and wrong for myself. Some would say there is no such thing as right and, right and wrong in the ultimate sense that we all kind of can have that, that our own opinions about that. Your truth, my truth, we hear that phrase a lot. The truth doesn't actually exist, it's just an opinion. And there was others who would say, well, uh, essentially, the majority determines what is right and wrong. And if the majority in a culture thinks something is wrong, then it is wrong. And if the majority thinks it is right, then it is right. And of course, because the majority opinion could change, that means morality can change and it is not fixed. But uh, somebody who believes that God determines ultimately and for all time what is right and wrong would say that right and wrong are fixed and that they are not subjective to our preferences, right? So, the assumptions that we have about morality and how those are determined will have a lot to do with what we think about literally everything. And finally, the issue of destiny. What happens when I die? There are a handful of options here. Some people would say, well, when I die, I uh, go to heaven or I go to hell based on um, you know my theology or based on, uh, of course, the Christian answer to that question is not based on what I do, but what God has done for me. Um, but there are others who would say, well, I can earn my way to heaven and there is, there is a heaven. Others would say that there is no heaven. You just fade to black when you're dead. Um, it just disappears. There's nothing. There is no afterlife. Others might say, well, I come back um, I come back as a, you know, as a raccoon if I didn't do well, and I come back as some kind of um, heiress in my next life if I did do well in this life. And there's just kind of this, I, this karmic idea of I come back better if I did well in this life. So those are the different assumptions that people have about destiny. All of these, and we can understand, and there's there's a lot of different combinations that you can you, that you can work through if you try about origin, meaning, morality, and destiny, the set, set of beliefs. But I hope it's becoming clearer that the things I say I believe, my assumptions about each of these things, will have a dramatic impact on what I believe about the issues that we refer to as uh, political. So let's take this back to this cartoon that we introduced this idea of worldview with uh, for a moment. And how might we resolve this question of whether this is a six or a nine and the assumptions that we come to this with. And the easiest way to resolve this dilemma, of course, is to talk to the person who put the digit on the floor. And of course, that requires an assumption about the origin of what we're talking about. And the assumption there is that somebody actually put it there, that it was purposeful, that it was an intentional. And so if we can bring that person to bear in this debate, we can find out, okay, which direction is up? Is this a six? Is this a nine? But of course, if no one put it there, if this is a random accident, if a windstorm caused this, there's no way to know this for sure. So what we believe about the origin of the thing is going to determine the answer ultimately to our question, and so it is in all of life. What you believe about the origin of yourself, what you believe about the origin of your friends, what you believe about the origin and purpose of a city and a community and a nation will determine what you believe uh, the correct answer to the questions are. So that's a little bit, and, and the, those questions, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll almost skip through this, and the key questions that we can ask about ourselves and literally everything, 
where did it come from, and what is it for? We can say that about this six or this nine, this digit. We can also ask that question about ourselves. Where did I come from? And what is it for? And if it is true that God created us with a purpose, understanding who we are and how God created us is going to be really, really helpful in finding the correct answers to those questions. So back to putting worldview in context. Um, worldview is simply one of the things that influences how we process life. And so I hope that little exercise made it clear to you why in some why you disagree with your friends because I assume that many of the people that I'm speaking to now you guys are Christians and so you have a Christian worldview you have a Christian set of assumptions but the people that you may go to school with that you may play on teams with that you may associate with they might not have a Christian set of assumptions therefore it makes sense that they think differently about the world, that they have different answers to these critical questions because they are operating under different assumptions. And this is helpful to understand in our conversations because they're not stupid and you're not stupid, probably. Um, but because you do have different set of assumptions, you reach different conclusions. It's also not a function of bad motives. And this is something, a mistake that I think is often made in these conversations is that we assume they want, you know, as soon as we can't reconcile our differences, people will say, well, you're just a bad person and you just want people to die. Or you're just a bad person and you want to control people. Or you're just a bad person and you want to, you know, murder other people. Whatever those are. Some, in most cases, people have good intentions. They are just applying their good intentions to a different set of assumptions about reality. And that, in part, explains why people think differently. But it's not the only factor. And another thing that matters, about it, that, that determines why people think differently and behave differently, is because of the external forces acting on them, what you're told to believe, okay? And everybody can relate to this because we all live in, in, in a community of some kind. And when I refer to external forces and what you're told to believe, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, in some cases, it's your parents. Your parents are always giving input. Your friends are giving you input. Uh, your favorite YouTuber might be giving you input. People around you are telling you what you should believe about absolutely everything, how do you respond to that? Do you believe them because you like them? Do you not believe them because you don't like them? Uh, do you believe the way we respond to the voices outside of us um, is part of what determines what we think, what our beliefs will be? Now, of course, some people telling us things might be right, and so they should be listened to. And some people telling us things might be wrong, and so we should learn to kindly ignore their input and not apply it to our lives, right? That's the challenge. That's where discernment and wisdom and really having an anchor in scripture is super important because just, beca just because someone has good intentions and they're a likable person and we enjoy being with them does not mean they understand God's truth. And the temptation is to be um, lured by good intentions and people that we like. And because we like them and we know they have good, good intentions, we're inclined to agree with them. Christians cannot think that way. We have to be able to navigate those voices from the outside uh, more carefully. Now, um, in addition to external forces, there are internal voices. And this is what's going on inside of us. These are our desires. This is our ambitions. What do I want to believe is true? There are always people outside telling us what we should believe. But then inside of us, there's these desires. And sometimes we want to believe things are true because it gives us pleasure. Um, because I want to believe I can do this thing and there will be no consequences because I just want to do that thing. In some cases, we don't want to believe things are true. When a doctor gives a bad medical diagnosis to someone we love, we want to not believe that thing because the reality of it is very difficult. And so some cases, um, what we want to believe is, is no. In some cases, what we want to believe is yes. But again, the way we respond to our desires is a function of our worldview and a function of what we believe is true. And um, because, and I, I refer to Jeremiah 17, 19, 17, 9 there, and there's actually a lot of verses that I will commend to you um, later that you can look this, look this up. But the idea that the human heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things, who can know it? That's what the prophet Jeremiah wrote about the human heart because we are uh, infected by sin. And what that means is 
we cannot trust our desires. We cannot trust our impulses, and that's why Christians are fortunate to have the Word of God, which gives us God's plan, God's will, despite the way we feel, so that we can filter our feelings through the lens and through the prism of truth so that we are not being held captive by our feelings. But again, that's a worldview assumptions because people who believe there are no truths above us, their feelings are their guiding light. That is their North Star and they believe that our feelings are the key to happiness. And so those people, their, their truth is that they should indulge all of their feelings, all of their desires, because that's how they're going to become happy. Those of us who are Christians understand that that's not the true. And in fact, because our hearts are broken and deceitful and sinful, that our feelings are often the path to hell. So um, when it comes to filtering through life, we will reach different conclusions and a different set of, of, of belief systems based on what our worldview is, what our assumptions about reality are, um, how we respond to people around us, external forces, as well as how we respond to internal forces. How do we respond to our own heart, our own desires? The combination of those things all determines what our beliefs are, the knowledge that we hold as true. And the fact is people who sit in the same churches together uh, will reach different conclusions because they have different worldviews, even though they're in the same church. Sometimes they haven't recognized these, reconciled those things. And also, um, they respond differently to the people around them. They, they are better or worse at responding to peer pressure. They are better or worse at understanding uh, the right voices to listen to. And also because people have varying degrees of self-control and the ability to, to resist their own impulses. So this is how we get beliefs in worldview. But as I stated at the beginning of this slide, the goal here for Christians is not simply to have the right beliefs. It's to do the right thing. And the way we connect beliefs and the will is really character. It's courage. It's the ability to um, respond to situations that we're uncomfortable with, that we don't love, and do the right thing thing, even when it's hard. And the, the, the difference between character and worldview. Worldview, you can learn about in a book, essentially. You can listen to lots of lectures so that you answer questions correctly. But character and courage are not things that you can live, you, you can learn in a book. Those are things that you see demonstrated and it's something that you experience, which is why in discipleship and within the church, living life together is so important which is why it's so important that, uh, that adults model for their children courageous living, character-filled living, so they see the, the fruit and the benefit of that lived out. Because there are a lot of people who know the right answers to the questions but cannot apply it because they're afraid of the world around them. They're afraid of the response they're going to get. They're afraid of being mean-tweeted. They're afraid of being misunderstood. All of those things. And, and that fear has much of the church locked down from living out the reality that they understand, but they can't bring themselves to do anything about because they have not learned to be courageous. And so that's my ex exhortation to you as, as leaders, and you are all le leaders in your own way, is remember, both fear and courage are contagious. And if the people around you are fearful, you will learn to become fearful. If the people around you are courageous, you will learn to be courageous. And obviously, courage is the better path. Now, Summarizing all of this, the biblical worldview, um, what the, the, the high level narrative of scripture is you have creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. That God did create us. These are the big assumptions about for, for the Christian life. Sin came and broke the world. We fell. Jesus came to redeem the world. And ultimately, we are going to find restoration in him, in heaven, for eternity, not rest, not re restored here on earth, because this is this is broken. But one day we're going to have a new heaven and a new earth. So we don't have to try to save the world for forever, because it's not intended to last for forever. Because we have the promise that God is going to restore it. Now let's compare and contrast this biblical worldview, this biblical story, to what I'll refer to as a woke worldview. Instead of creation, we have evolution. So we, we appeared um, by accident. The real problem in the world is not sin and the fall, it's injustice. The way we redeem that world is, the, the way we fix the problem is not through the redemption of Jesus, but it's through revolution politically. And our hope is not in a restored heaven and earth, but it's in utopia here on earth. And that's a very different way of seeing the problem 
and the solution. It also explains why people on the political left are are so politically intense because they have no hope if they can't solve all the world's problems here and now. That's why they put so much of an investment in politics. It's why they care so deeply when elections don't go the way they want them to because they have nothing else to place their hope in. Now, that's something that we really, uh, we can pity them for, but it's also worth understanding this is where they're coming from. They too want to solve the world's problems. They just misunderstand what the world's problems are and therefore they propose the wrong solution. But you can see that all of this, the woke worldview and the Christian worldview, are born out of a different set of assumptions about origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Now, another reason why this matters is not just because it influences our political debates and it leads people to reach the wrong conclusions, but within the church, what we're finding is that people are Christians, people who grow up in the church, are leaving the church over these political issues. Um, America is, big, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about America, and I know I'm talking to a, a Canadian context, but I know there's similar similarities here. Some studies I've, I've read recently here. Um, in just the last decade, the number of people claiming to be Christians has declined 12% from 77% to 65%. Not only is it less Christian as a percentage, the total number of professing Christians has declined from 176 million to 167 million. So as the total population grows, the number of people claiming to be Christians declines. And that was a decline of 23 million people over 10 years. What should be more concerning to the church is the fact that those who claim to be Christians don't actually believe Christian things anymore. Research by George Barna estimates that only 17% of American Christians who consider their faith to be important and attend to church regularly have a biblical worldview. And not only are, is the population in general becoming less Christian, the church is as well. As convictions of the church decline, the number of ex-Christians increases. The fastest growing religious category is the nuns. It's those who claim to have no religion at all. Over the last decade, the number of Protestants declined 15%. The number of Catholics declined 12%, while the number of nuns grew 70% from 12% of the population to 17% of the population. That's an additional 30 million people who now claim no religious faith. Now, the reason I tell you this is because much of the reason why this is happening is because people within the church do not believe that the gospel is true or good. Some of them who even believe it's true, they don't believe it's good anymore, and that's because of these political conversations, um, because they've been convinced that it's bigotry, that it's intolerant, uh, that it's judgmental to say that something is wrong, uh, that it's unkind to say that we can't define our reality for ourselves. And because the church has not been taught why the gospel is good, why it's good, why it's the key to human flourishing. People are walking away because they think it's mean to be a Christian. And that, at the heart of that, is all these quote-unquote uh, political issues. So we're, we're losing the issues in some cases, and that has its own kind of, of, of fallout and body count when it comes to the issues of abortion. But also what we're seeing is around these issues, we're seeing people who otherwise uh, are raised in the church, raised in a Christian environment, simply walking away uh, because they have decided uh, on the basis of these political issues that they no longer want to be uh, associated with God's position. And those are the reasons why I say that po politics isn't really about politics. We are ultimately engaged in a spiritual battle. We have been from the beginning. It's not surprising. Don't be scared of it, but understand what it is that we're dealing with. You're in a spiritual war. You're not ultimately arguing with a Republican or a Democrat about a political issue. These are conflicts over the nature of reality. We have to make sure that we have examined our own worldview to make sure that our positions are, are consistent with the assumptions that we say we believe, the things we say we believe about the nature of our lives. And if they aren't, we got to fix them because we have to make sure that God is ultimately the foundation of, of, of what we believe. But also understanding 
that the debates that we're having uh, with other people are best described not by uh, blue or red or Republican or Democrat, left or right, whatever those are, but it's best described by the fact that we are uh, we are in a spiritual war over truth about the nature of reality. Go back to Genesis 3 again. Uh, did God really say? That's the question. Can we believe him or can we not? All of these political debates are just a a reflection of that ultimate question. So hope this has uh, helped you. I hope it's brought you some clarity. I've really enjoyed being with you. Thank you so much uh, for your time and attention. So thank you so much, Joseph, for that very eye-opening talk. I do have a couple of questions for you. The first is submitted by one of our CLC youth. He asks, um, why do you think it is that so many teens and people in general lack a clear, defined worldview, and he wonders if it might have something to do with uh, the role our education system plays. Well, I think most people are simply not aware of what their worldview is, and and the the education system is teaching worldview, regardless of what your education system is. Everybody is 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 learning a worldview. They're learning a set of assumptions about origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. They're being taught uh, where they came from or if they came from somewhere, whether their life has meaning, if they determine right or wrong, or if right or wrong is determined for them. Uh, they're being taught a set of beliefs about what happens when we die. So I... Uh, Sometimes people are learning this more passively than purposefully, uh, and and even if some if, if you haven't been catechized in a in a specific set of answers, you are still absorbing a set of belief systems that will inform everything that you believe. So uh, the the worldview that you will you will adopt passively is probably the one that you're just surrounded by. Which is why when it comes to biblical reality, when it comes to what is true, that has to be taught intentionally because it is not being taught passively. And, and so specifically with kids who are in the church, who are raised in the church, who have an understanding of faith, um, you're seeing many absorb a secular worldview effectively, though they would claim to be Christians, claim to have faith. They are thinking and acting as if they are they, they are secularists because they have not connected the dots. They have not made the connection between what they say they believe is true and how they live that out in their lives. And when you then test the conclusions that they reach, the beliefs that they hold, what you find is that they flow from a secular set of assumptions rather than a biblical or Christian set of assumptions. So you have people who even think that they're Christians who really uh, effectively in terms of how they think uh, are not Christians, um, though I'm not. That's not a judgment on people's souls. That's just a judgment on how they process information and whether they they think consistently with the things that they say they believe are true in Scripture. So related to that, uh, some pro-lifers think that the best way to grow the pro-life movement is to secularize our messaging so that we can appeal to people of any religion mm -hmm. or no religion, and this is especially pertinent in Canada. And related to that. Um, some people think that the National March for Life should sanitize itself of any mention of Christianity. So knowing what we do now about worldviews, can I ask why you would think that that's a mistake, presuming that you think it's a mistake? Yeah. Well, I, I, I do think that it's important for those of us who consider ourselves to be ambassadors for Christ, who live for something greater ourselves, to not be ashamed of that. And, and it's okay to lead with that. That being said, all truth is God's truth. And I think there are both deductive and inductive ways of getting to truth. So you can say, because God said this is true, I believe it is true, therefore. But you can also work backwards. And in social science will inevitably prove that what God said is true is true. And we see this very clearly on the abortion issue, where in, you know, at least here in the United States, it was 1973, where the, the, we had this Roe versus Wade decision that really kind of was the, was the demarcation of this abortion movement, where people were making the argument, well, it's good for women, it's not actually a baby. Nobody loses. Everybody wins, right? What's not to love? Now, scripturally, we knew that it was a baby and we knew that it would not be good for, for women. But once we have, now that we have had, you know, 50 years nearly of experimentation with this tragedy, 
we all know that the assumptions that we held at that time are not true, that it is not good for women. It actually is a child. And so we are learning what we could have just, if we had just believed what God said was true in the first place, we could have saved ourselves the pain required to learn the lesson. But inevitably, reality will always uh, testify to the fact that God was right in the first place. So all that to say, you can make arguments that appeal to a, to a secular mind just because the real world is going to bear witness to the fact that what God said was true in the first place. And so I'm not opposed to uh, understanding who your audience is and, and leading with an argument that they're going to relate to if they are kind of, if they bristle at, the, at explicitly theological arguments. But we also shouldn't be ashamed to, to recognize this is where we're coming from. This is what the truth is, because ultimately, when somebody becomes persuaded of the truth, the fact that they could have known that in the first place by just believing what God said was true uh, should ultimately leave them closer to the truth. Because really, the, the goal for people is not to make them pro-life or make them agree with our political position. It's to help them understand their maker and discover what their purpose is in life. And so we should, we should keep that in mind as we are testifying to the truth in a public space. I appreciate that answer so much. I think there's a lot of wisdom there. And I'd just like to thank you once again, Joseph, so much. It was such a privilege to learn from you. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And with that, we are about three quarters of the way through this conference, and I hope you are enjoying it a lot as well as learning. And that's the whole point of this conference is we want it to be useful for you. Now, this provides us with a great opportunity to talk about the sponsors, the organizers of this youth conference, and they are Campaign Life Coalition Youth, as well as Niagara Region Right to Life. So CLC Youth is the youth branch of Campaign Life Coalition. We're a national pro-life and pro-family organization seeking to protect all human beings from conception to natural death. We comprise part of the political arm of the pro-life movement. Obviously, the National March for Life is one of our big events, but we also organize other activism like Life Chain and local 40 Days for Life campaigns. We're also active year-round in identifying, educating, and nominating pro-life candidates and in municipal, provincial, and federal elections. Um, we're also involved on the international scene uh, with the UN. Um, that's what Matea does actually as our global policy and advocacy advisor is push back at attempts to enshrine abortion as an international human right. And then honestly, it doesn't matter how talented we are uh, how hard we work, um, we couldn't achieve anything without you. So at the heart of COC's mission is to empower and mobilize you, the pro-life grassroots, to get involved in the political process and make a difference. And so all the resources you need to do that are provided by us um, so that you can lobby your politicians and educate your peers Simply go to campaignlifecoalition.com. If you're not already uh, receiving our emails or following us on social media, please make sure uh, you do that. We're facing an onslaught when it comes to issues like abortion, euthanasia, censorship, parental rights. So we really need your help to do that. And even if you aren't able to help us with everything, hopefully you'll at least be able to help us with something. And then of course, CLC Youth provides special ways for pro-life youth to get involved. So we have a summer internship program, for instance. It is now too late to apply for our 2021 internship program, but you can always apply next year in 2022. You can apply to be part of our UN delegation, or if the border ever opens up, you can potentially join us on our trip to the Washington, D.C. March for Life. And then um, we also do presentations to youth groups, classrooms, churches. So if you're interested in that, definitely um, hit us up and we'd love to arrange something um, like that for you. Now, Niagara Region Right to Life offers this youth conference alongside CLC Youth. And they're a charity that seeks to educate youth regarding the sanctity of human life, as well as examining society's views on various life issues. Now, one of the ways they do this, in addition to the youth conference, is by facilitating the Father Ted Colleton Scholarship every single year alongside the interim newspaper. 
Now, this is for individuals in grade 11 and grade 12, and these students are challenged to write an essay on the theme pertaining to life issues, and winners will receive up to $1,500. So if you're in either of those categories, make sure you plan on applying for this scholarship. Now, while we're delighted that the Youth Conference could be offered for free this year, and we thank each one of our partners for doing such, if you've really been impressed by it thus far and have the means to do so, you can always donate to Niagara Region Right to Life by visiting niagararegionrighttolife.ca forward slash donate so that they can continue providing essential education programming to youths in the future. Anyway, we know that you're probably antsy for a break now and we will get to it momentarily, but I do want to remind you that Will Witt the face of a lot of Prager U social media videos. His talk is still to come, so make sure you don't miss that. We will be reconvening at 6.20 p.m. Eastern. That is 7.50 p.m. for you weird Newfoundlanders, uh, 7.20 p.m. Atlantic, uh, 5.20 p.m. Uh, Central Daylight Time, 4.20 p.m. Central Standard Time or Mountain Time, and then 3.20 p.m. Pacific. So once again, um, make sure that you don't miss Will's Wits talk happening at 6.20 p.m. Eastern. And then following his talk, we will um, have our small group sessions that Matea mentioned previously. They are optional, but they will give us an opportunity to discuss the youth conference and what we've learned. So we figured that during our dinner break or snack break or washing break or however you're going to be using your time, that we'd give you the chance to listen to some very talented musicians who were gracious enough, kind enough to lend us their gifts and their talents to provide us with some entertainment during this intermission. Just like we've been doing for years and years during our in-person youth banquets. So we hope you appreciate the music and remind you all to be back here by 620 Eastern. Enjoy. Hey y'all, it's I'm Jordan. I'm a 16 year old singer songwriter who was born with spina bifida. I'm really excited to be singing for y'all today. This is an original song I wrote with Shirley Shepard and it's called Don't Give Up On Me. It's about parents who have just been told their child will be born with a disability and I wanted to write this to encourage them to not be afraid of the diagnosis. I hope you enjoy.
turn your eyes upon Jesus Look for His wonderful face And the Oh soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Through death into life everlasting. We are oh, Turn your eyes upon Jesus Look full in His wonderful face Shine upon you and be gracious to you.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you guys are all eager to hear from Will Witt from PragerU and that you had a good dinner or a snack or whatever you chose to do with your time. And that those of you who did take advantage and listen to the musically gifted pro-life youth, youth who did entertain us liked their performances as I truly did. And we'd like to give them a very, very big thank you for being a part of this year's I Am With You, the 2021 National March for Life. And that's the great thing about music, isn't it, Josie, that it really does bring us all together. And it really embodies the theme that I am with you really, really well. I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank all of the youth who contributed to our 100 Day March for Life countdown um, with the Thursday Thank Youths profiles. And I have to thank all of my National March for Life Youth Committee members by name. In fact, you might be able to meet one or more of them if you are participating in a small group meeting later on today. Um, if we were having an in-person youth conference, I'd call them all up on stage and have them do a little dance for you. <laughs> but this time around, they're spared from that embarrassment. And I don't want to speak for their dancing skills, but it might be a, a saving grace for us as well. Anyway, I'd like to thank uh, Maeve Roche, my assistant youth coordinator, she was part of the National March for Life Organizing Committee as well, and she interviewed Alex Schattenberg uh, for, along with the Euthanasia Deception, which was one of our earlier Life on Film nights. And then Julia Vizanet, a current CLC intern, uh, she put together all those musical performances for us, also coordinated the registrations for the youth conference, as well as Shania Neely, my former youth coordinator, Gregory Tom Chishin, Stefania Gangel, Jillian Villanueva, Mikhail Mitra, Michael Mahotsky, and Martin Minton. We couldn't have done it without you guys, and it was such a privilege to be on Parliament Hill yesterday with you all. Um, personally, that's actually my favorite part of the March for Life, is just being surrounded by a bunch of pro-lifers and absorbing their joy. I know that the issues that necessitate a National March for Life in the first place, abortion, euthanasia, obviously they're tragic, they're somber, they're depressing. But I think what I like so much about the rally and the March for Life is that in face of all of these reasons that we have to despair, we nonetheless have hope. And that hope is so infectious. It's just a really beautiful moment of humanity. So Mateo, what's your favorite part of the March for Life? Honestly, I don't just have one favorite part, but I would have to start with possibly the Mar um, the candlelight vigil. And that was the first event I actually had ever attended for any March for Life event, period. And I arrived and it was it was dark outside and everyone was holding candles and there was this music about about life and love and, and the dignity of every person. And there was prayers offered. And even this year, we had some incredible musicians and testimonials given. And so I, I really personally love the candlelight vigil. But of course, I'd be amiss not to state that I absolutely love marching through this streets of Ottawa in defense of life. And, and like you said, it is infectious, that joy, that love that we have for humanity. And so also the youth conference, I mean, we're here today, a slightly biased, I really like being around young people and getting to, to hear their stories, even hear their struggles, because we get to support one another in that way and show that truly you are not alone and that we are all here as one body lifting up life uh, in defense of life. So for me, it would probably be those top three. So just to recap uh, the youth conference so far, um, off the bat, we heard from Tony McFadden of Relationships Matter. Then we heard uh, from Jay Watts about pro-life apologetics and then Joseph Backholm about worldviews. And I think Matea and I have stalled long enough for those coming back late from dinner because That's you totally know it's going to be those people. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, Let's, uh, let's just get on with the show now. Alrighty, so our next speaker is an incredible speaker, actually, from Prager University. We have Will Witt joining us. Now, Prager U is a digital company that puts out short videos on the most important discussions and topics of our day and age. And Will creates digital content as well as travels across the country to speak about issues that matter the most to him. Now, his videos have reached over 600 million views. 
and has impacted thousands of people, including myself. And he is a leading voice in the younger conservative movement. He lives in Los Angeles, California, where he works to promote the values of Americanism and freedom. So welcome, Will. Will. We are so honored and blessed to have you joining us today. Well, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here. Sorry if my dog is making noise in the background, but he, he'll settle down after a sec. It's all good. We love dogs over here at March for Life. Now, Will, your talk is around your personal experience and reaching the hearts and minds and even changing them on the issue of abortion. So is there anything that people should know before we delve into your presentation? Yeah, I think it's really important that we're the forefront of what we do with this information. You know, it's one thing to be able to have a lot of facts and, and, and things about abortion or the pro-life movement. But if you can't use those facts and information effectively to actually change minds, then it's practically useless. You know, imagine if Albert Einstein the, was genius, never actually used any of the information he had to do any good. So he had to be able to know how to use it. So my talk is really about how you can use information to actually change people's minds effectively. That's awesome. So I look forward to hearing it and we're going to delve in right now. What's up, guys? My name is Will Witt. I work for PragerU living in Los Angeles, California. Bear with me for this presentation. A little bit sick under the weather, but getting over it should be fine. Just might have, you know, some coughing fits during this. But don't worry, I'm not dying. Just going through it. But I'm really glad to be doing this. I don't think there's enough people out there talking about abortion. I think that conservatives have kind of gone soft on the issue, if you will, and they choose not to talk about it because they feel like it's just not a winning argument to have anymore. And I'm totally against that. I think that the arguments that we feel like the left are totally taking over in culture, we should be even more strong about taking over again. So I think we should talk about it. I'm really honored to be here. And thank you for having me and thank you all for listening to this. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about me and kind of why I'm passionate about this issue. I grew up in Colorado, which I guess some of you guys are in Canada, huh? So maybe you don't know about Colorado. Colorado is a great place. I love Colorado, but it's very left. And I grew up a liberal atheist my entire life. I was not a conservative. I was not a Christian. I don't believe in any, didn't believe in any of that, right? My senior year of high school, I actually ended up interning for this Democrat senator. So I, I thought Obama was pretty cool. This was, this was my life. I was the complete opposite of what I am now. But, you know, most people, they go to college as conservatives, their kids, their parents raised them right. And then they become liberals. Mine was the opposite. I went to college and became a conservative and I went to Boulder, CU Boulder, which is just a liberal hellhole essentially. And I was in a, I was an English major and I was in my intro to sociology class and there's this girl sitting next to me, this black girl and my TA, she looks at me and she says, you are oppressing this girl because of the color of your skin. We we're talking about white privilege and all that nonsense. And the black girl kind of looks at me and she's like, I don't know what's going on. This is really awkward for me. Right. And so I didn't feel like I was oppressing someone and she didn't feel oppressed, but somehow this TA at this $50,000 a year university gets to come and tell me that I'm oppressing someone, right? This is how you create the victim culture in America. This is how you get people entwined into leftism. And so after this, I started getting very, very involved. The girl I was dating at the time actually ended up being a huge leftist pro abortion activist, which again, didn't really like now, <laughs> excuse me. And I started getting very involved. I found out about Turning Point USA. I worked with the Republican Party in Colorado. And then I found out about PragerU. And I actually went on my campus. I asked students what they thought about the wage gap, asked women what they thought about the wage gap. And of course, they think they're so oppressed. I sent it to PragerU. They love the video. And long story short, they offered me a job. So after two years of college, I dropped out of school and moved to Los Angeles to pursue my dreams of being a conservative political commentator or whatever you want to call me. I don't know. I have a, a myriad of of titles. So it's very strange in that position to do that. Anyway, when I was in college, what I would do essentially my sophomore year, when I started getting really political, I didn't go to class at all. I hated college. I hated going to class. And so I would instead go on my campus and set up a table and debate people all day. And it'd be funny because my professors would walk by and they'd be like, what you weren't in class today. I'd be like, yeah, sorry, this was more important to me. Right. So I debate people all day and I debate people on socialism and the minimum wage and police brutality and, and all of these different kinds of things. This was about five years ago now. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of the topics that I remember debating kids on was abortion. I would go out there. I would set up the signs that had like the different, uh, how do you say, like 
different pictures of of stages of life of a uh, a child in the womb, right? And I would set those up and then debate people on it and talk to them about uh, really what this means. Like, is it a life? Things like that. And I would get some hate. I mean, I would have people coming out just absolutely berating me, yelling at me, cussing at me, yelling death threats at me. I mean, just horrible, horrible things that, you know, you, I'm sure, watcher, wouldn't ever imagine saying to another human, but these people would do it to a complete stranger on the street because that's their leftist religion. You know, the, the, the left has turned all of their ideas into a religion. As we've taken God and Christian morality out of America, out of the universities, they've had to replace it with something. And so what they've done is replace that with leftism. Leftism is a dominant religion. And one of the main pinnacles of that religion is that you are pro-choice. If you are not pro-choice, you cannot be a part of our leftist religion. It is paramount to these people, right? And so I work for PragerU. Hopefully uh, you guys know about what PragerU is. You can go to PragerU.com, watch all our videos. But essentially what we are, we are a digital media company here in Los Angeles that aims to preserve the values of America, preserve the values of the Constitution here, preserve the values of, of freedom, essentially. And so we may be founded by Dennis Prager and we make videos on just really every topic out there, science, history, politics, uh, religion, I mean, everything. Right. And so we do a lot of videos on abortion. Dennis has done a lot of videos on abortion, talked about it. And he's just, you know, a brilliant guy. He's my main mentor for a lot of stuff. But we're, we're very focused on this issue, I will say. And we've put out a lot of content for it. So so for me to be doing this again, it's a huge honor to be giving this presentation. But when we're looking at the left and we're looking at how these people view abortion as a whole, you can see just how hypocritical it is. And so with this, I want to I want to get into it and break this down, essentially, on why they're hypocritical. And I don't think I, I'm going to be honest. I th One of the main questions that I get asked, you guys have seen my interviews that I do on the street or whatever it might be. The number one question that I get asked from people is like, how do you not just just laugh at these people when they're when they're saying these stupid things to you and i'm like i can't i can't go out and laugh at these people okay i am doing a job if i laugh at these people or get angry at these people they're not going to have their minds changed on the issue actually right and so it's really important for me to to keep my composure and so it's like i don't blame i mean there's some blame on the students of course or the people who i talk to who are very pro-choice there is some blame there but it's not entirely their fault i mean you need to blame the the hollywood celebrities who do this you need to blame the universities you need to blame the mainstream media and 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 academia like these are the things that you need to blame so it's like i don't want to ever like really look at these students and think wow they're so stupid and dumb i i hate them no of course not like these people have been brainwashed they've been brainwashed into believing lies that they think are true and they believe that it's good right? They believe the things that they're doing are good. They think that they're fighting for women's rights when they fight for abortion. When in reality, this is a human life issue, not a woman's rights issue. It's a human life issue, but they've been totally twisted around. The conversation, the argument has been totally twisted around to make it seem like it's a woman's rights issue. And that's one of the main points that we can get into first is that men, men specifically, I am a man. You know, I know it's 2021. It's kind of controversial to say, but I am a man. <laughs> and I think that men should be just as strong advocates against abortion as women should, you know, and if you go, I'm sure many of the men who are watching this right now, you go out or you're on social media or whatever it might be. And the first thing, the first thing that you hear when you try and give your topic, your opinion about abortion is that no uterus, no opinion. You're not a woman. You can't talk about it. Again, this is a way that the left shames you so that they control the entire narrative. But if they knew anything about biology, which these days i don't know if they do but if they knew anything about biology they would know that it takes two people to make a child it takes a man and it takes a woman right you are just as as much of a say in this as the woman and you should treat it as such so when people try to shame you that you don't have a uterus or you don't you're not a woman so you can't talk about it this is to the men out there again this is when you push back even harder and try and fight for these things even more because these aren't arguments about you know, that argument of them saying you can't talk because you don't have a uterus, that's not an argument about logic or or making sense of the situation of abortion. It's an argument against your character yourself, right? Or something that is, you didn't even get to choose. You were born a man, right? 
So they're making it against that to totally shift away from the actual argument. And so what I want to do in this presentation is give all of you guys the facts and the questions. You know, there's a lot of persuasive ways that you can change people's minds. It's really important. <coughs> that you do it the right way because if you don't do it the right way then you're just going to end up having people yell at you on campus calling you horrible names <laughs> so it, it's it is really important that you do it in the right way because again in my videos yes people do look stupid occasionally but my paramount pinnacle principle a lot of peas has always been to change people's minds and so if you can do that in your arguments you're going to be doing great Guys, there's a possibility you might see some cuts in this speech. It's because I had a coughing fit. <laughs> and so I had to stop the, the speech for a moment. But we're back, okay? I want to get into a video that I did on campus. Or no, this wasn't on campus. This was at Echo Park, actually. I don't know if you guys are familiar at all with Los Angeles, but Echo Park is a place where liberals love to live, okay? It used to be, you know, a pretty ghetto area, and now it's, it's changed, and now it's very left. So I went there with a petition. I had a petition that said, save eagle eggs, right? And so I was asking people to sign this petition that says, you know, eagle eggs, they're, they're baby eagles, they're being smashed and killed, you know, whatever. And if you sign this petition, we want to save them, right? And people were like, oh, of course, I love, I love eagles. I'm a big bird fan. I'll definitely save these eagles. I'll sign your petition. And every single person we talked to, every single one of them wanted to sign the eagle petition, right? They, they wanted to preserve the life of an eagle. Okay, so then after that, we did another petition right after, and we said, okay, we also have this other petition to end abortion. You know, this is another child, you know, a eagle child and versus human child. This is another infant that we want to save. Are you willing to sign this petition? And at that point, people kind of got the gist of what we were doing in this video and the point we were trying to make, and people didn't like that very much. Um, <laughs> which is okay. It is okay. Cause we are trying to prove a point with that video. And the point was, is that people care more about the life and value of an animal and care less about a human, which is a scary thing. It's a very scary thing to have it be that way because the left, you would think that they would want to preserve human life. I mean, that's like, that should be forefront of every single person's mind, right? Every single person living in America should want to preserve human life, but they don't. But they don't. They would rather just keep going with their radical leftist agenda instead of actually looking at the facts behind it and, and determining that this is a human life. And so let's go into a little bit of uh, the hypocrisy again and like break down some of the arguments. One thing that they'll say a lot, you know, which I hear, maybe more in Los Angeles than in other places, just because Los Angeles is such an absolutely terrible place. But I mean, I'll talk to people and they'll say it's totally fine to abort someone up to nine months, right? Nine months, third trimester. This is when the baby's just about to pop out. And they're totally fine with aborting it then. They say woman's body, her choice. She can do it at nine months. How absolutely insane is that? But let's break down why that's insane. For example, let's say you're pregnant and your baby's supposed to come out on July 4th, right? It's supposed to pop out then. And you end up giving the baby... Are you delivering the baby on July 3rd, a day before? Some people, and the baby comes out perfectly fine, of course. I mean, it's a beautiful baby. And people would say that it's totally fine for you to abort the baby on July 3rd, a day before your due date was. How insane is that? That you can look at this and say, this is a fully developed human that is ready to come out and you can abort it. You can end its life a day before. So breaking down, <coughs> excuse me, going in and breaking down all of the different steps of time starting in nine months and breaking down their argument there and going all the way back to conception is going to be a really strong way that you can actually change people's minds because i don't think they 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 understand they don't think of it as an actual human life you know someone like albert einstein you guys know albert einstein genius you know he was a preemie you know he was born uh, I think it was like two months before he was supposed to, like the, his mother's due day was, right? Imagine if he was aborted. Imagine if all of these people who were supposed to be, you know, let's say a nine month thing and then came out seven months or eight months at their, their time were aborted beforehand. These are amazing people who did amazing things, right? So using real world examples of people who actually were premature is a great way because these people, it doesn't matter when you come out of the womb, okay? Just because you come out of the womb 
at five months or seven months or nine months, it doesn't change the sanctity of human life. You are still a human no matter what time period that you come out of the womb. And don't let people tell you otherwise. Because again, great people like Albert Einstein came out of the womb early and still were some of the most brilliant, amazing people that have ever lived on this earth. And so a lot of these situations that I'm giving you right now can be turned into questions and, and facts, right? So it, when you're talking to someone about abortion, you can really start on this. You can say, oh, are you fine with aborting them up to nine months? If they say yes, then you go into what we just talked about. And then you kind of break it down. You keep going with it, right? My my book that, that is coming out this fall, which you guys can pre-order on Amazon if you just search my name, How to Win Friends and Influence Enemies, is essentially 20 different topics and all of the topics are the different questions that you can ask people on each one with the facts on how you can change people's minds, right? So it's like essentially your survival guide for how to change minds on really any issue. And so it's really important. I, I take the asking questions portion very seriously about this and the persuasive ways that you guys go about it because that is how you're going to actually change minds and influence people. It's one thing for people to look at you preaching about abortion. They're like, oh, there's that Bible thumping abortion or anti-abortion lady again, right? It's like, you don't want to necessarily be that person. You want to be someone who adequately over and over again can positively change people's minds, change people's lives, right? I had my mind changed. So it's, it's totally possible to, to do. After asking about the nine months, you can go into the six months and ask them, you know, are you okay with aborting a child up to six months? And if they say yes, then go into what the baby actually looks like at this time. At six months with the right medical care, the baby could survive out of the womb. The baby has hair. The baby is sleeping in regular cycles. I mean, again, this is a this is a child. This is not some clump of cells, which we'll get into the clump of cells argument and as we go down the line. But this is this is a fully formed child. I mean, you should show these people pictures and say, do you think that this is an actual human or do you think that this is a clump of cells? Ask them. You know, would you consider someone who has hair, can sleep in regular cycles and can survive out of the womb a human or is that just a, a clump of cells to you? Right. But it's again, don't be passive aggressive with your comment, with your questions. I hope that I didn't come across that way, but don't be passive aggressive or trying to, you know, be rude to these people. You're genuinely asking because your questions are going to lead into the next question, the next question so that you can actually convince them and then see what they say about that and tell them. After going on the six months with them and seeing if they can change their mind on aborting at six months, then you can go into the three months where you can say that the baby actually feels pain. The baby feels pain when it has an abortion, right? And also its organs are visible. I mean, again, again, I'm going to reiterate again, you're going to hear this a lot, but it's a human life, okay? It's a human life, that baby that is in there. This is not just the clump of cells. This is a human life. Convincing people on that is so important. If you can give this fetus humanity then people's minds are going to be opened a lot easier. Again, ask in the right way. Why do you think it's okay that you can abort it up to three months? Would you still believe in aborting it up to three months if you knew that the baby could feel pain? If you knew that its organs were visible or at six months that it had hair? You know, things like this. You ask them in a leading way to get them to change their minds on it. And then you can go into the first trimester and people will at this point think that this is just some zygote you know a single cell organism like uh, amoeba right that's what they'll think of the baby in the womb at this point in the first trimester but again it's not the baby has hands it can open and close its hands and by even three weeks the baby has a heartbeat as early as three weeks right this is not some amoeba this is a, a human and so again asking them the questions and saying do you would you change your mind on abortion the first trimester if you knew that the baby had a heartbeat or if you knew that it had hands that could open and close or that it was developing limbs or that it even had teeth even in the first trimester the the, the baby has teeth right would you want to abort something like that so you can go in and giving them the facts on all of this to say, here's how you actually change their mind. So with these questions leading it with all of these different stages of the baby in the womb, you can change their mind and get them all the way down to zero, right? Get them all the way down. And then now you get to people saying, well, you know, if the, if the woman knows it like really early on, then I think it's okay because it doesn't have a heartbeat. It doesn't feel pain. It's not alive in their eyes, right? It's not, it's not a fully formed human. But what to convince them on next is that no matter what stage of life that you are in, that doesn't define your humanity. Your humanity is defined by you being a human, right? It, it doesn't really get more simple than that. If you are a human, then you have humanity. 
And so abortion is murder because you have a child that is in there that is alive. You know, just because someone is 80 years old doesn't make their humanity any, excuse me, any less than someone who is still in the womb. Age doesn't mean anything when it comes to you being a human. Convincing people on this is incredibly important because, again, making them realize the humanity of the child is going to make them change their mind. I was, I was at a UCLA, you guys know, a, a school here in California, and I was interviewing this black girl about abortion. It was a great conversation. She was pro-choice. I was pro-life, obviously, and we talked for, I don't know, like 15 minutes. It was very cordial. And she told me that her mother was going to go to the abortion clinic to abort her I think it was, I think she had like a bad boyfriend situation or something like that, I was going to go to the boy, the, the abortion clinic to abort her and the abortion clinic was closed, right? I mean, I personally see that as an act of God, but anyway, why I'm bringing this up is that like this girl could have been aborted, but she was then pro-choice and living a wonderful life where she was able to go to UCLA, get a college education and all of that. There's something important about that. That is death is final, right? For people, death is final and you're not going to be able to experience things in this life if you were never born, right? Or if you die, that's fairly obvious thing to, to compute there. But it's like, think about all of the people 60 million since Roe v. Wade, right? 60 million abortions since Roe v. Wade. All of those people who never got to live out those lives that they needed or not, didn't get to live out the lives that they should have. People who could have been doctors and scientists and make groundbreaking medicine and engineers or, you know, conservative media personalities, whatever the case might be. These are people who could have had amazing, wonderful lives that they cut short because of abortion. And to me, that is just a, such a, a sad and horrible thing. And the fact that people are okay with that is really sad, especially when you have someone who could have been aborted, again, to, speaking about this girl, talking to her, someone who could have been aborted in real life and then still is pro-choice. How can you still be pro-choice after that, right? I mean, I'll talk to people. One thing that is really, it, it's, it's really telling about this whole thing, which I'm sure if you're using these questions and you're breaking it down this way, you'll, you'll get to this point. But people will say, you know, at the end of that argument, <clears throat> they'll say, well, I would never get an abortion, but if, every, if other people want to, that's totally fine. This is how you know you've won the argument if people start saying that because they don't want to put that moral implication on themselves because they know that it's wrong. They know that it's a human life and they don't want to put that moral implication on themselves, but they're fine with letting other people do it. Now, this gets into a whole question on morality and ethics, but if you know that something is wrong, you know that something is murder, then you should be pushing to not have it for other people too. If you wouldn't do it for yourself, then you shouldn't push it on other people as well. You shouldn't push it on other people when you know for a fact that it is wrong and it is murder. You know, I mean, we have laws in America that say you do not murder, and I think pretty much everyone would agree that's probably a pretty good law to have. <coughs> And so with that, if you can define abortion as murder, then why would these people say that it's fine if someone else does it, but they're not going to do it? And it's because of how the left has tricked people into believing that this is a woman's rights issue. It is not a woman's rights issue. It is a human life issue. It is the exact same as going out on the street and murdering someone because the life is a life no matter what stage it's in. And one of the other arguments you guys have probably heard and will continue to hear and probably won't ever stop hearing is the my body, my choice, right? You guys hear this one all the time. And breaking down this one is, is again, fairly simple. I mean, you ask them, you know, if someone had different DNA and genetics than you, is that a different person or is that the same person? They'll say, yeah, of course, that's a, that's a different person. Well, the baby living inside the mother has different DNA and genetics. Is that a different person or is it just a part of her body? A pimple on your face. I think I have one up here on my, on my forehead. It hurts. A pimple on your face is a part of your body. That is a part of your body. A child living inside of you is not a part of your body just because it's feeding off of your nutrients. You know, it's like, is, is a tapeworm? If you had a tapeworm leather up inside your body and live inside of you. Is that a part of your body? No, of course not. It's a tapeworm inside of you. Not saying that a baby is a parasite by any means, but I'm just saying it's something that's using your nutrients that is living inside of you, right? It's not a part of your body. It's a totally separate entity, even if you are taking care of it in a way. 
But then people will say, well, the mother has to provide those nutrients the, for the, the child in the womb. Doesn't that mean that it's a part of her body? It's like, no. A mother outside of the womb when your baby's born. You have to give it milk. You have to give it, you know, baby food, a little Gerber. You got to take care of the baby outside of the womb, too. That doesn't mean that it's still a part of your body. The, giving the, the child nutrients has nothing to do with it being a part of your body. People will say at the end, they'll say, well, the baby couldn't survive without the mother. Without the mother, the baby would die. And it's like, yeah, that's true. That is true. If the baby was just left and didn't have any nutrients, of course it would die. But think about a baby that's one years old that's been born and has been living in the world for a year. Imagine you left that baby by itself. What would it do? It would die. Of course it would die. You know, it's like just because the, the baby is dependent on the mother doesn't mean that it's a part of her body, right? So all of the, the different arguments that the left will give to, to defend my body, my choice are all rubbish. They're all rubbish and they can be easily broken down. This is a way, again, for them to not make it a human life. They make it so that it's not a human life. They make it seem like it's this parasite living inside of you that is not a part of your body that I just... You know, whenever you want to, you can go in and kill. It's totally disgusting, but that's how it is. That's how these people think. And that's a really sad thing, but you can break down their arguments. You've broken down before. We talked about, we broke down the, the trimester, different arguments on how the baby actually looks. And now we've broken down the my body, my choice argument, right? And again, taking these things and putting them into questions. And it's important to know too, that if you're at this point in the conversation with these people and you're talking to them about, you know, this baby being a human life, and let's say they, they come to the agreement that the baby is a human life, then ask them if they think that the baby should have rights. If this baby is a human life, does the baby deserve rights just like any other person? And that's when you'll get them. That's when you get them on the argument where they're saying, okay, maybe I'd get an abortion, or maybe I wouldn't get an abortion, but if other people want to as well. It's like, okay, but if you said that the baby is a life, and you've, you've confirmed that essentially with them, that, that they believe that all of these signs of life are actually making it a human life, then the baby should have rights. So you can't be telling other people that they can do it but you won't if you agree that is a human life. It is against the law to murder. You can convince people on these things. Again, it's about asking the questions. Like, I'll use another example, right? Like, let's say I'm going on campus and I'm asking people about climate change. It's not even related to abortion, right? It's just a different issue. And I say, climate change isn't that big of a deal, right? That's going to put people pretty much on the defensive. But if I go up and I say, why do you think the world's going to end in 12 years? People are going to be much more receptive to having a conversation with me. And so at the end of the day, with all of this and all of these different questions and all the different facts and things that you go through, leading them into the, the right answer, it's not you necessarily changing their mind. It's them changing their own mind based off the questions that you made them answer. If they can't answer your question or their question doesn't logically line up with the way that the world works or their answer doesn't, more, moreover, then they're going to have a very teachable moment where they are going to learn something new and change their minds on the issue. Think about like just in your own life, you know, people coming up to you and trying to tell you things. Uh, humans are a stubborn species, a stubborn species that doesn't take other people telling them what to do or how to think very well. So you're not trying to do that. I know that like you're on Facebook or you're talking to someone, it's very, very easy to let your emotions get in the way, to let your your anger get in the way because these people the ideas won't go through their head right but if you do it in a certain way i mean these methods have been used for hundreds and hundreds of years to change minds if you do it in this certain way asking people questions and using the facts within the questions to actually change their minds you can do so much more good there's a there's a good a temporary high that comes with being angry and and trying to just debate the liberals so hard but if you want to change minds, I guarantee you this is the best way that you can do it. I want to I want to kind of wrap it up with with my advice on on what you can do as a, a pro-life advocate because like I talked about in the beginning of this speech with conservatives and people who are pro-life basically handing over the argument to the left and saying this is this is done, we're not going to do anything else about it really. We don't really want to fight anymore. There's nothing else to do. I want to say first thing is don't really put your faith in politicians to get anything done. Like think about in here in America, um, you know, in 2016, we had Trump in the white house, a Republican, and we had the house and the Senate, right? So we had full Republican leadership essentially. And 
not, don't even think about like getting abortion outlawed, right? We couldn't even get Planned Parenthood defunded in America. And that's with all Republican leadership. So our, our politicians are in a lot of ways useless, at least in my opinion. Now, many of you might have different opinions on that, but that's kind of how I view it. And so it's really about a culture issue. And that's why the, the single conversations are so important. When I was in college and I was becoming a, a liberal, or becoming a conservative after being a liberal, you know, it only took one girl, one girl came up to me, she had a Trump pin on her backpack, I still wasn't that political. And she said, Oh, hey, who, who are you voting for? I was like, you know, I don't really know yet. She's like, Oh, I'm voting for Trump. And then I was like, Oh, why? And we kind of talked for a little bit. Excuse me. And it was because one girl decided to come come up to me and have a conversation with me that I'm now where I am now. I mean, giving speeches across the country, uh, having a podcast doing uh, you know, my, my videos and, and everything else that I do and author, like all of this, because one girl decided to have a conversation with me and get me in touch with some right people. So you're thinking that you're there and, and wherever you are watching this and you're saying, you know, I'm only one person, like, what can I do? It doesn't really mean anything. Like, it doesn't matter if I go out and speak up because nothing's going to change. You have no idea literally no idea what will happen if you speak out or who you're going to impact. You talk to one person, they talk to another person. It's a chain reaction. If everyone can learn the skills and then have the tools to change minds on the issue of abortion, then you can make a huge cultural shift. And then maybe one day we'll have people who actually have our values that can make these kind of changes, right? But it's like, you have to be willing to go out there and have the conversations. Again, I live in California right? Any of you guys ever been to California or whatever, you, you, you'll know how, how just terrible it is. But it's, it's that way because of leftist policies, but it's because conservatives totally surrendered. They surrendered the entire argument, the entire uh, political world to the left here in California. And so it's, it's because conservatives didn't stand up and do anything. So I think a lot of the issue with abortion and why it's gone the way that it is with so many people getting abortions is because conservatives and people who believe in the pro-life stance have given it up and don't do anything about it. And that's a sad fact, but that's how it is. And it sucks that people don't actually go out there and stand up for their values, right? In 10 years from now, are you going to say that you are someone who watch the world go by and, and let it get worse? Or are you going to say that even if it did get worse, I fought for it. I went out there and tried to tell every single person I know about these values because they're important to me and they're important to God and they're important to the world. You are doing a disservice to yourself and the world if you don't go out there and spread these values out there. It is so important. You can never sacrifice your values for anything or anyone. That is the most important thing you can do. And I end it, I end every single one of my speeches by telling people that because it doesn't matter all of the things that I say, all of the, the tips and questions to ask. I, it doesn't matter any of that if you don't actually go out there and do something about it. <coughs> it doesn't matter at all. Imagine if Albert Einstein, again, talking about him, had all this knowledge in his brain. I mean, a genius. And he didn't go out and actually do anything right? It doesn't matter what you have inside of your head if you don't actually do anything with the information, with the facts, with the, the, the everything that you have. So my advice to you guys is to go out there, make some changes if you can, and tell everyone that you can about these issues using the questions and using the tips that I gave you. You will change minds and you will be doing yourself a favor helping the world. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. You can find me on social media at The Will With. Follow me there. And any other questions you guys have about abortion, send them to me. And and I'm, I'm very proud to be a pro-life advocate, especially as a man. I know, don't have a uterus, whatever. I, I love standing up for these values, and I'm going to continue to, and I hope all of you guys will as well. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Will, so much for your presentation. I love how it not only equips us, but empowers us. And that's the whole point. We have to be able to communicate our lived experiences in order for others to be successful as well. So I really appreciate that about your presentation. Now, we did get a couple questions in from our audience today, and they are as follows. So I'd love to hear your feedback on them. The first one is you've talked about the left's attempts to indoctrinate students on college campuses in previous videos that you've done. So what do you wish you knew before entering college? 
I wish I would have known how bad it was. I wouldn't have even gone for the two years I did. <laughs> so I, I went to school for two years and then dropped out. And a lot of that time was really a waste of time for me. I, I mean, but before I went into college, I was actually a liberal. You know, most people are, they're taught conservative values by their parents and then go into college and become a liberal. Mine was the opposite. I became a conservative when I went to college. So <laughs> before going into college, I just wish I would have been, I guess, better equipped for how bad it was. Uh, eventually I did learn how bad it was and I was able to be brave and stand up and fight for the things that I believed in, but I wish I would have known it off the bat and known that the things that I was doing initially in college were actually a waste of time and that I should be focusing on other things. Great answer. Thank you very much. Our second question is you are someone who's very vocal about your beliefs and we all appreciate that about you. Have you always been that way? What advice do you have for other young social conservatives who want to discuss similar issues but aren't sure where to start? Yeah, I'll give you a story. This just happened three days ago. I was speaking at the University of Northern Colorado, and the administration came up and they said, Will, you have to wear a mask while you give your speech. I'm like, you guys are idiots. There's no way I'm doing that. So, no. And so I go up on stage, I have my bandana on, and after about five seconds, I take it off. About 50 protesters erupt to go crazy. The, the administration cuts the mic, and then they kick me off campus because apparently I'm making people unsafe where there's 50 protesters, like, thugging, being, making a scene. I mean, it's just terrible, right? And so, but in that moment, I still took all the 100 kids who were left who wanted to see me speak. I took them outside to a public street and gave the speech to them there. And so my advice to everyone is that it's super hard when the left is, is pushing you around every single time, you know? It's, you can give in every single time, but you give them an inch and then they take a mile. So it's incredibly important that no matter what circumstance you're in, that you always stand up. I mean, that's the number one place to start. People are worried about what the left will do to them now if they say something. They should be far more worried about what the left is going to do to them in the future if they do nothing now. 110% agree. Absolutely. All right. Last question for you. What challenges have you faced for being yourself within the public sphere? And do you have any advice for dealing with the current societal trend for, of counseling young white men, especially in the abortion debate, which is viewed as more of a women's issue than a man's problem? Yeah, I think that the left has totally hijacked the argument where they use the the my body my choice the you know it's a part or it's not a part of the woman's body stuff like that they use it as a means to shame men who stick up for the values of of pro-life issues so i think that it's really important that as young men ourselves you know or at least myself and any of the young men watching that it's even more important that you stick up for these things even more sometimes than the women, because in our circumstances, we're being told by the left that we're not allowed to have an opinion. And so you should fire back even 10 times stronger and say, look, it's biology. It takes two to make a, a person. Why can't I have an opinion on this? I should be able to have an opinion on this. And so when you're faced with people trying to, you know, distinguish you in a bad way because of your gender, sex, whatever, then you have to push back even more and say, no, I am allowed to have an opinion on this and here's why I'm right. And again, using the, the methods that I used within my, my speech before, use those and be able to change a lot of minds. Absolutely. And we really appreciate, I mean, even for myself, the fact that you're willing to even communicate that because a lot of people are just faced with a bombardment of narratives within our culture. And we actually see someone our own age who is sticking up and saying, actually, you can have an opinion, you can voice them and we need to do so. It's, you know, truth can be really sometimes hard to communicate, but speaking the truth is the most loving thing you can do for others in your social sphere, in society in general. So thank you so much, Will, for your time and your presentation. We really appreciate all you're doing. Make sure everyone you go follow him on all of his social media platforms. He's basically everywhere and everywhere. I see his face on a daily basis. So make sure you go follow him and we will keep in touch. Thanks, Will. Thank you. Appreciate it. Wasn't that terrific, but as satisfying as it was, coming to an end of Will Witt's talk means we're also coming to the end of the youth conference. Although I'd urge you to please, please don't forget about our small group sessions happening at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Before we go, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to our phenomenal speakers, Tony McFadden, Jay Watts, Joseph Backholm, and Will Witt. You are all doing commendable work for our Lord. I'd also like to thank our Niagara Region Right to Life donors, without which we wouldn't be able to hold a youth conference at all, much less one for free. 
And I'd like to thank Dunn Media that was responsible for the branding, the promotional video, and the packaging of the whole youth conference. Kevin Dunn and team, you have our gratitude. I'd like to also give a special shout out to Everett and Sherry. Thank you all so much. And most importantly, we'd like to thank you, each and every single viewer. It's because of you that we even hold this event in the first place. And Josie and I can personally attest to how difficult it can really be on a day-to-day -day basis, constantly having to stand up for your beliefs. And it can be really hard. It can be hard to be pro-life in this world. But it's easy if you remember that you're not of this world. We are merely in it. And our final destination is truly heaven. So thank you so, so much, everyone, for caring despite the cost. And this isn't actually the last March for Life event. On Sunday, May 16th, we are hosting an event, our final Life on Film, and it's called Blood Money. I'm doing an interview with Roman, Roman Sachez from Blood Money, and I'm really excited for all of you to tune in. I will be there. Make sure that you're there as well. But we'll uh, give you the opportunity now to prepare for those small group sessions happening at 7.30 p.m. As long as you didn't uh, register at the last minute, you should have been emailed a link. If you can't find it, then perhaps check your junk mail. These small group sessions, um, as I said, will be led um, by pro-life leaders, perhaps members of the National March for Life Youth Committee. And they're an opportunity for you to talk about the youth conference, uh, what you learned, what your favorite part was, uh, what speaker you liked the most, if there was anything you disagreed with, and importantly, how you can get involved further. So I know that some of you might be a little bit tired right now, but these sessions will be pretty chill. Um, they are optional, but they're just half an hour, so I'd urge you to hang in a little longer. And then regardless of whether you do or do not attend, I want to remind you all that CLC Youth Metaphorical Door is always open. You can reach out to us anytime over social media at CLC Youth Pro Life, or you can email youth at campaignlifecoalition.com. We are here to empower you. That's why we exist. So please don't think uh, that you're bothering me at any point. Um, again, we'd love to hear from you. And with that, we officially conclude, I am with you, the 2021 National March for Life Youth Conference. I think I speak on behalf of Josie and myself when I say it was truly a pleasure to be your co-hosts. May God bless you and all your efforts to defend the least of these, our brothers and sisters. And remember, that I am always with you. Just because he
to throw the game For only love can make a way All for love the heavens cry For love was crucified Oh how many times Have I broken your heart But still you forgive Only I ask And how many times Have you heard me pray Draw near to me Everything I need is you, my beginning, my forever. Everything I need is you. There's one more gift I'd ask of you, Lord, it would be peace here anew. As gentle as your children's laughter all around, all around. Your people have grown. Of living in confusion When will we realize That neither heaven is a happy When we live not in peace If there's one more gift I'd ask of you Children's laughter all 